three, four. It's five. yours. It's live now. So. Okay, go for it. All right. Um, is it recording? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's it's recording. Sorry. Um, the ASDI National Convention coming up on December 5th and 6th. Don't miss it. Please be there. <laughs> Don't miss it, ACI Virtual National Convention, December 5th and 6th. See you at the convention. Hey guys, looking forward to meeting you all at the ASEI National Convention. So don't miss it, it's on December 5th and 6th. Then I'm hoping to see you all there. So just log in and keep clicking away. Go ASEI. the ads play right so <laughs> i have queued them after the ads okay. and uh, i have two of them and we'll 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 play it yeah we'll play it baby what's the i don't need to do the hosting right i'm seeing <coughs> to admit in the waiting room yeah you've got right, right. Have no no others others will uh, take care of it we are live we'll, we'll take care of it we will begin and Hello all, welcome to day two of the National ASEI Convention, GET 2020, the Global Engineering and Technology sponsored by C4B Mortgage located in Troy, Michigan. So some housekeeping items before we dive right into the, uh, the, the, the introduction. So all of you in the audience will remain muted during the presentation. So please don't struggle to unmute yourself. But we would love to have your comments and questions. So in order to have an uninterrupted presentation, we would request you put your questions in the Q&A box anytime during the presentation or right after. We're going to get to, to, uh, get to it if we have the time. We will be monitoring the chat and we'll post the questions to our speaker at the end of the presentation. And today's webinar is being recorded. We will share the link on www.aseiusa.org. We welcome you to bookmark and visit the website site to access resources and apply for your membership so you can hang out with some cool folks throughout the year. All right, so did you know that the genetic structure of the virus SARS-CoV-2 was sequenced within weeks of its discovery and it was done with the help of both scientists and engineers? Optical, electrical, mechanical, computer, chemical engineers were all involved in making this possible. And this shows how you are important and significant to this calling that your profession has brought about. We had a fascinating and insightful day one with amazing speakers and presenters sharing their stories, experiences, and a fantastic output towards the finale with some really cool, creative young minds of the future. So what's in store for today? Let's hear it from the man himself, my dear friend and very, very sharp president of ASCI, Jwalan Lakia. Thank you, Anu. Thank you for your enthusiastic anchoring yesterday. I know we are in great hands with you uh, today as well. On behalf of American Society of Engineers of Indian Origin, ACI, I want to welcome everyone to our 33rd annual convention. As you know, the theme of our convention is Global Engineering and Technologies, GET 2020. I hope all of you are having a safe 2020 in these unprecedented times. Usually our conventions are held in person, hosted by one of our chapters in the East or West Coast. We decided to switch to a virtual 
convention due to the obvious challenges we are all facing. The objective of this event is to provide a forum to promote and share advancements related to latest cutting edge innovations and technologies across various engineering disciplines. To that end, we have planned these two days of sessions featuring many distinguished speakers from various technical and engineering disciplines. We are very grateful to all speakers and session owners for taking time out of their busy schedules, even during a weekend. As Anu mentioned, we had a very successful day one yesterday. In addition to amazing keynote and technical sessions, we had six youth finalists showcasing their work in engineering and science. We will be announcing the winners of our Youth Technology Exposition or YTE during the closing remarks later today. We are also going to recognize several individuals for their dedication, hard work and exemplary contribution in their respective fields. We will be acknowledging those who have done extraordinary support and work for ACI. And this will take place during our award ceremony uh, at, towards the end of the day. I really appreciate all who have registered for this convention. Your participation encourages us to keep planning for events like this. I am also thankful to all our life members, regular members and well-wishers. If you are not a member, please consider becoming one at your earliest convenience. Our life membership is only $250 and regular annual membership is only $30. This convention would not have been possible without a strong team. So for our convention this year, Bhavesh Joshi is our convention co-chair. Rakesh Patel is also our convention co-chair. Piyush Malik is a convention content chair. Vatsala Upadhyay, she is our convention technology chair. And Dr. Thomas Abraham, He's our LCI Awards Chair for this year. We are also supported by our strong National Board of Directors. And as our uh, Board of Director members, uh, Bhavesh Joshi is our Vice President, Rakesh Patel, who is our past ASI President and Treasurer for this year. Ashok Madan is our Secretary and uh, ASI SoCal President. And then our rest of our Directors, Dr. Thomas Abraham, Suresh Larva, Anand Sankar, Radha Krishnan, Shafiq Bandagi, and Venkat Gurunatha. In addition to our National Board of Directors, we are strongly supported by all our local chapters. And Piyush Malik is our ASCI Silicon Valley President. Vasala Upadhyay, she is President of our Michigan chapter. Aaron Guman, who is the President of our Seattle chapter. Ashish Mehta from ASCI San Diego. And Sumedha Mohan from our uh, Washington DC NCC area. And obviously, along with these chapter presidents and their strong teams, um, ACI is fully supported both on East and West Coast. Before closing, I want to talk about our founder, Dr. Hari Bindal, who was a member of our national board this year. And uh, unfortunately, he passed away a few weeks ago. He was very excited to see us hosting this convention um, on his birthday. ACI was very fortunate to have Dr. Bindal as a mentor, guide, and visionary. And more on Hariji's legacy will be covered during um, our ACI award sessions later today. I wish all of you and your families a safe and healthy remainder of 2020 and 2021. Thank you, and back to you, Anu. Thank you, Jualin. COVID-19 has upended businesses around the world. Exceptional leadership during prosperous and tranquil times is important, but it often gets overlooked. It's during major crises that exceptional leaders stand out from others. So let's invite our brilliant Amrish Chopra, ASEI Silicon Valley board member and senior engineering director at VMware, the session host for our first session on day two, Leadership in Turbulent Times. Joining him is the dynamic Dr. Satyam Priyadarshi, the Chief Data Scientist and Technology Fellow, Halliburton, 
hopefully addressing how to move teams and create magic through any unprecedented crisis. Over to you, Amrish. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great start to a new day. Uh, we had a great time yesterday. Uh, this morning, our next speaker is Dr. Satyam Pradarshi. He is often recognized as the first chief data scientist of the oil and gas industry. He is a renowned global leader in the areas of big data, data science, analytics, and emerging technology. He has been applying his breadth of scientific knowledge and technology experience to, to provide expensive, uh, to implement powerful solutions in all aspects of data pyramid, which is important for business strategy. He has, been, he has appeared as a keynote speaker at numerous international conferences and published research papers in many peer reviewed journals and magazines. And he has co-founded startups in Washington DC, Silicon Valley, and, se and serves on several advisory boards. His research work has also been profiled in scientific magazines, including the Chemical and Engineering News, The Scientists, et cetera. Currently, Dr. Satyam Pradarshi is a Techn Technology Fellow and Chief Data Scientist at Halliburton, a global oil field service company where he leads the oil and gas industry's first center of excellence for big data and data science. He's also the managing director of Halliburton's India Center in Bangalore. Dr. Pedershi has received his MBA from Pamplin College of Business at Virginia Tech and his PhD in chemistry from IIT Bombay. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Pedershi. Over to you, Dr. Pedershi. Thank, thank you, Amrish. Um, so am I sharing the uh, slides, right? Yes, please. Um, all right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are attending from. Um, so this is, uh, the session is called Leadership in Turbulent Times. I think what we need is what I call reignite leadership. Uh, and the turbulent times is what brings us into what is the era called compounded disruption. What does that really mean? Uh, we'll talk about that uh, it, irrespective of the industry that we are talking about. So before I start my talk, I really need to thank a number of people. Uh, that means uh, the AS, AS, ASEI, um, and of course I knew Mr. Bin, uh, Bindal very closely through my association in the DC area. Uh, and I'm very sad about that. Um, we had good interactions over the last uh, two decades uh, here. Uh, and of course, um, thanks, thanks to this organization for inviting me and especially Piyush who invited uh, make sure that I am here. And then, of course, I, I wouldn't be here if my primary school teachers and my PhD advisor didn't uh, wired me the way I am uh, after my parents and my family. Since I work in oil and gas industry, I always get challenged both with both my son and daughter saying, Dad, you are in an outdated industry. And, uh, I, I, and because one has a Silicon Valley startup and other one is uh, starting something in the DC area. So I have to keep up with them. So learn new things as fast as possible. And this all lies in the philosophy of what I'm going to talk about. How do I keep up with them and uh, the next generation? And of course, my uh, friends and families all around the world and the teams I've worked. So with that, uh, what's, um, what's happening? What, when, when we talk about turbulent times, what is it? The, well, the concept that is what I call is the compounded disruption, which, I, which is pretty deep. That is, if you look at in the last uh, three uh, three decades, uh, digital uh, revolution has taken place in a way that nobody, uh, nobody anticipated. And when I take an example from the oil and gas industry, almost 30 years ago, people talked about integrated reservoir management and digital oil fields. In, and even after 20 years, we are still struggling to build something as an automated oil fields. So the revolution is there, but how do we leverage it? And now in the last five years, we are talking about what is called energy transition landscape. It is not just about energy industry, it impacts all industries because it's a domino effect. And then the emerging technology that are actually evolving at a pace that we are really not able to keep up with. Like for example, I give search, search technology, how many corporates are actually leveraging the search technology the way we actually use it on, in, a, our, in our public life. Uh, if you look at it, uh, significant capital loss is there for most corporations. And of course, the last year saw a new impact, which is called the pandemic impact, and which is still unknown, and we don't know what it is. Now, when you have this, this deep of a compounded disruption, this requires a different uh, strategy and execution plan. For that, you need a new kind of leadership and, and the talent that, that will actually take it forward. I, I really focus on that what it is, is actually comes from three three aspects of it. 
that means all these compounded disruptions actually cause impediments and that impediments have to be addressed at, at a speed that you can actually leverage uh, the new solutions that are coming or build new solutions which are innovative so that you can create the influence and eventually impact the business the fundamental of that actually philosophically lies in just 20 words that about one almost almost i would say 1 billion people in india <coughs> sing every day but they are not able to take it forward and that is from hanuman chalisa which says sukshm roop dhari sihai dikhava vikat roop dhari lank jarava bhim roop dhari asur sanghare sita ram ji ke kaas samvare now if you look at it it looks very simple that you you take a shape uh, big as like a lion or you make a big size no it's not that it is actually the concept is that you have a focus and a goal to achieve you take avatars of what it will take to actually achieve that goal for that you may uh, become an intellectual you can become a creative person you can become a scientist you can become an engineer at different times for solving a different problem this concept of avatar of varying dimensions and degrees is very important so this hanuman chalisa's uh if i can actually if anyone can understand this fully then i think there is no there is no need to read on thousands of leadership books because this whole chopai is actually the sar of pretty much all leadership to be successful in any business this has been my mantra for or this has been my guiding force all my life uh, from being a scientist to a technologist to an executive to having fun in oil and gas industry now and why i say that is because this is what you do you do you build your avatar of varying dimensions and degrees to address the challenges and the remove the blockers that you have so that you can achieve the goal that you want so you go you never stay in the status quo because every every challenge is going to be different from the past one and that means you have to have paradigm shifts on an ongoing basis in business world we talk about paradigm shifts every 10 years so to say but as a scientist and uh, when thomas kuhn wrote this long time back the paradigm shift is every time and every time uh, like means to in this month next month uh, uh, you can put any time scale to it but this paradigm shift remains there and we need to really adapt to it and that hanuman chalisa chopai actually guides you to lead that transformation and and how do we apply that i just give you an example from a oil and gas industry which mo most people think that okay it's an outdated industry it's not really true because there's a lot to be done if you look at uh, upstream down midstream downstream i am not from oil and gas industry at all i came from a scient uh, chemistry background of quantum chemistry and then worked in many other fields and then got into this just for as a hobby and last 6 years have been a, has been a great ride here but if you look at it the challenges that goes from upstream to downstream like the whole oil well life cycle is significant from exploration to all the way to retail when you buy your gas from the gas station uh, concepts that have to be changed uh, requires a significant knowledge of what is going on uh, underneath and that actually requires the change the way you lead it and that leadership and the technology adoption and adaptability and in, in fact the industry has been talking about crew change for last 50 years in fact one interesting concept in oil and gas industry is that 50 years ago they used to say that we have only oil left for 50 years and today also they will say the oil is left for 50 years so the question is this uncertainty is there and all these different forces are challenging us to to be relevant in this energy transition landscape which actually impacts every other business so the leadership change has to take place that means you take different shapes and form to actually address that to adopt the technology and then address the talent gap as well because if you look at it behind the scenes everything that we did in this industry will look much smaller than what we are facing today in let for example can we build autonomous drilling can we build autonomous platforms or any other area like if you think of the example um, of a uh, couple of years back we were talking about cognitive computing in a big way but if you look at uh, the tesla cars or the any any of the autonomous cars the challenge is 
those those equipment are not able to build a full talk, cognitive system yet because if those of you most of you came from india and if you have ever ridden a block bullock cart from one one village to another not driven by anyone they never may, meet with an accident whether it's daytime or night time so that cognitive power has to be captured to actually address these kind of challenges because every every challenge that is in the past will always look smaller and it will look as if oh, it was such an easy thing it looks remote so if we actually address those impediments create the influence and move forward with an impact that's what we need to do so in, and this can only be done if we do the two two factors that i call that karma matters that means karma you know if you think of it that what is it knowledge gain the knowledge of any industry as i said i personally have nothing to do with oil and gas industry but uh, six years have been a great ride uh, fundamentals are same uh, then you create the rights avatar for yourself to address the challenge whether i'm doing geophysics or am i doing drilling or am i doing uh, hse uh, and then recognize the value of that how the business is impacted this requires you to actually remove the mirage that is around the around the industry or any of the challenges that you solve and then you adapt and agile build adapt and adapt and agile solutions so that you can go forward so if you think of it what i just talked to you is that uh, uh, that if you understand the fundamentals of that chopai and you follow the principle of karma that is the karma matters a any industry any problem you can actually lead that space without any uh, hesitation uh, personally that has been my experience i have moved from different industries and uh, when i left academic full time to become in the corporate world i decided that i want to be in the c suite in less than 10 years of joining as a individual contributor and the day i joined a ceo and a chairman's board that was nine and a half years into my journey and whole of my success depends on hanuman ji and all the training that i got and this chopai and this is what i have applied and i we can go anybody has any questions on that happy to answer answer lot of these things i have written in various shape and forms and here is here is my co uh, contact information as well uh, so anybody who wants to talk about with that i thank you for your time i think uh, i would stop here Awesome, Dr. Pradarshi. This is very motivational for Sunday morning. Thank you. I appreciate your time. This is actually excellent. Uh, I, I'm glad that you used uh, our old uh, scriptures for the newer times. So you sort of like melded them together. Uh, amazing, excellent. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you very much, Dr. Pradarshi. Thanks, Thanks very much. Anu. Thank you, Dr. Priyadarshi, for addressing this new level of complexity in leadership, talent, and strategy using um, our uh, Hindu uh, references. Appreciate your work and time. Um, session one beautifully transitions into career management in a disrupted economy as we stand today. I never saw it coming. It's a very common lament, isn't it? Majority of the companies wither, not because they have surpassed their core capabilities, but because they don't recognize that the competencies that once made them distinctive no longer define success. A whiff of tragedy, nevertheless. Companies are overtaken by a changing world, changing demands, new technologies, new users. So let's bring back our energetic Amrish Chopra, ASEI and Silicon Valley board member and senior engineering director at VMware, who will introduce our next speaker, Dilip Saraf, author, speaker, career, and life coach. Thank you, Anu. Thanks very much. Uh, COVID-19, as Anu was mentioning, has created uncertainty. What future jobs will be? How will we interact, uh, engage in them? Uh, the accepted notions of job security, career progression, career choices, they have been shaken by how this pandemic has disrupted our traditional views of career management. Uh, our next guest is Dilip Saraf. He's a renowned author, speaker, career coach, and is the top career coach of LinkedIn. Uh, Dilip that works with over 7,000 clowns, including myself, uh, globally since launching his fifth career during the downturn in 2001. Uh, Dilip specializes in career reinvention and has pioneered the concept of inductive resume, which helps clients take their career from the known to the unknown. Together with his genius discovery tools, inductive resume, and forward-looking messages, Dilip has made several breakthroughs in how professionals should project their message 
and manage their careers through compelling verbal branding. Vidip has also authored five books and has published articles in Harvard Business Review, Chief Executive, and other publications. He has a weekly career thought on, on LinkedIn and is widely syndicated 500 plus blogs by other publishers enjoying wide readership. Uh, Dilip on, also holds two technology patents and has an IIT from Bombay and Stanford. Thank you very much. Please welcome Dilip Saraf. Welcome Thank you, Amrish. Greetings, everybody. I'm going to launch my uh, PowerPoint. I hope you can all see it. Can you see the screen? Hello? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm going to quickly run through. I'm not going to read every line of my text here, but just give you a thematic sense of what mindset we need to adopt to deal with the disrupted economy. The previous talk actually is a good launch pad for my own topic here because what uh, the speaker said in the past talk is very much relevant to what I'm going to do in terms of how to, how to make your avatar work in each transformation of your career. And I've done that five times in my own career. So I'm going to go through this and walk you through how we're going to do this. Um, so so I wanna, this is the agenda. Basically, the most important part of this topic that I'm going to discuss is the reinvention, which is what I have done with many clients. I have done it myself. The power of the infinite game, which is basically what the previous uh, speaker was talking about, altars. You can really assume any number of altars and the power of the infinite game versus playing a finite game. I just want to talk about that. And the changes you can make, which is the actions you can take to make these altars work for you. So I'm going to talk about those. So let's go through some of the disruptions. You know, COVID is right in our face right now. So that's all we think about. But if you go back even just 20 years with the Y2K and the uh, 2001 bubble bu bursting, the technology bubble bursting, the outsourcing that happened, technology disruptions that have happened, cloud, AI, transportation, all of these things are, are continuous over the last 20 years. So there is nothing unusual about COVID's disruption as compared to what we have experienced. So we need to be prepared always to deal with any disruption that comes around. And that's the readiness that I'm gonna show you how to do. So how to be prepared for this, right? So the first thing is you have to uncover your own story. I call it CPOP and CPOP stands for customer point of pain. We have been programmed now in the paradigms we use is what is your elevator speech or what is your value proposition? That's what we think about, but that's internally focused. That's me. Nobody cares about me, what they care about them. So the customer point of pain is a shift of mindset that you need to bring about in how you think about what the CPOP is for the customer you're dealing with and how does that translate into your value proposition or your elevator speech? We do it normally exactly the opposite. We say, "My, this is my value proposition. You want to buy it? No, no, I don't because you don't know my pain point. So that's, that's the main important point I want to, 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 to emphasize here. And learning to frame your story and cultivating the growth mindset. So you need to be able to frame the story, and I'll give an example in the later slide, of what the story is that you are telling yourself first. And I'll give an example of that just a few slides down. And then how do you transform that story, as the previous speaker said, the avatar, so that the person looking at the story says, yep, that's my point of pain. You got it. What can you do for me? That's how you need to kind of take the person you're talking to from where your mind is to where their mind is. And that's not a hard thing to do if you understand how to communicate that well and how to become credible in that communication. We tend to focus on the language that we understand, the lexicon that we use, but we need to understand the language 
the recipient will understand. And there is always a difference between those two languages. And for you to be able to become credible with your genius, and I'll talk about that in a minute, you have to convert the language that you normally use to the language that they understand. And that's how you have to master your communication. And broaden your network. Now, everybody talks about doing network, but just attaching more people in your LinkedIn network is easy. But building the community is where that is all about. And community that you serve and the community that derives input to you, gives input to you, and makes you more uh, empowered, if you will, by virtue of how they interact with you. So merely building a network in my mind is not enough, but you have to build communities around the networks you build. That requires a lot of active effort. And unless you do that, you cannot change your avatars because each community that you build have to, has to understand the avatars you're transmitting. And, and, and once you have that language to convey that avatar, the communities that you'll build will understand that through your credibility. Develop a strong brand. That's very important. It takes time to build the brand and learn how to learn because there is so much content now being generated constantly, new topics, new technologies, new approaches, new applications and so forth. There is just no time. But if you can do the meta learning around it and understand conceptually what is happening, that requires a different skill. And once you master that skill, and it's not that hard to master, then you can speak the language that the recipient will understand and will accept your altar a lot more readily rather than getting into the details of the learning of any particular topic. So let's go, what are the strategies that work? It's A, B, C, D, E. I'm not gonna read you each one of them, but once again, build your relationship, build your networks, be vigilant about untapped opportunities. There are always untapped opportunities especially in a disrupted economy. And I'll give you two examples right now. I have a Hollywood music director. She was nominated for Oscar awards and so forth. But she called me early this year after right after the COVID thing happened. I said, Dilip, all the production is shut down. What can I do with my orchestra and with my talent to build these uh, musical themes? And I said, look, people are stuck home and, and they are very interested in having exercise videos. So can you score for exercise videos that are highly specialized and at the high end? And that's what she's doing now. And she really has recently scored a really big uh, score on one of the home video exercise videos. So that's an example of how can you get into from where you are to where the opportunities are in a disrupted market. I'll give you another example. I have a client who, who deals with financials, he, he institutional financing, and he was laid off right in March, right after COVID hit because you know the stock market tanked and all that happened. So he came to me, he said, Dilip, what do I do now? I said, well, you, you understand investments. People are nervous about the stock market. You understand the high end of this market called high network individuals. Why don't you become an individual consultant and work with them to show in this pandemic, what are the right opportunities to tap so that you can consult with them individually. And that's exactly what he's doing. And, and he's making a lot more money than he did as an employee. So you have to always find how can you, how can you identify these opportunities and how can you quickly shift into an avatar that will work for you. Now I'll come back to the story that I told you about before. You hone your own story, first tell it to yourself. It's an extremely important point that I would like to explain to you with my own story. We are very good at telling our story like the elevator pitch or whatever it is. When I started my fifth career, which is career coaching 20 years ago in, in 2000, people asked me, Dilip, what do you do? And I told them my response was, I do career coaching. After some successes that I had with really very visible clients and they landed well and so forth, I developed some confidence around my ability to coach and transform people and reinvent them. And then when people asked me, Dilip, what is that you do? My answer was, I am a career coach. So I went from, I do career coaching 
to I am a career coach. It took me about two or three more years when I really had great successes with really well-known people in the Silicon Valley and outside in the world as well. I changed my story to say that I'm the best career coach there is. And if you find a better coach, let me know who that is. That's the story I told myself. And the way it made an impact on me changed the way I practice my craft. So ever since then, I've become LinkedIn's number one coach. LinkedIn ranks their coaches based on the number of recommendations they have. I have like 270 some recommendations. Most coaches have like 12, 20, 30, 40. And the point, I'm not bragging about it, but I'm saying that once you brand yourself as the best there is, things happen that you can leverage. And, 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 and that's the story that I'm telling. You should tell yourself first rather than telling others what your story is. And that's to me is a very important point. So figure out what your own story is, tell it to yourself, own the avatar, and then go out and see how easy it is to sell that story. Always keep yourself market ready and establish trust and credibility. These are very important aspects of how you can sell your avatar many times once you get these ABCDEs done well for yourself. So what is the reinvention? What does it, what does it entail? It, it, the awareness of CPAP, you have to understand what the pain point is, not what you do, it's what they want. And that requires some insight, some research, some intuition, some, you know, more than just knowing about yourself. Clear way to connect with the target. Once you understand the CPAP, customer point of pain, you need to clear way to connect the customers with the, with the target. A story that sells, just like I told you my story, you need to tell your own story and the story around what you're going to do to alleviate their pain. What is the story that you can bring to their party? And people say, oh, for the interview, you have to be confident. And my, my, my take is, yes, confidence is important, but empathy is more important than confidence. Your ability to understand and sync up with the audience is much more important than having great confidence with which you impart your story. Executive presence is important. In fact, you can go to LinkedIn. I recently posted a blog about what framework for executive presence works. And it's, it's a pretty comprehensive blog about different aspects of executive presence that basically allows you to influence people much more readily if you understand that framework and create your story around how to execute that framework. And, that, and, and if you read the blog, you will understand that. And the final thing here is I wanna say, playing the infinite game, not the finite game. And I'll tell you what the infinite game is. We are programmed to play to compete with somebody. And when we compete with somebody, even at the personal level or at the company level or the corporate level or the, or the division level, when we do that compete thing, we are playing a finite game. What I'm saying to you is the infinite game entails competing with yourself. And I'll tell you a story that goes back to 2004 Olympics. I don't know how many of you remember this, but there was a 16 year old uh, athlete ski skiing, I think, or skating. I think it was skating. Her name is, uh, her name is um, Hughes. I forget her, her first name now. Uh, and, 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 and the whole press was around two really star gold uh, medal winning athletes that they were fighting against each other. And the press was covered by that. And, 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 and this uh, Hughes, 16 year old said, I'm not going to mess with that. I'm just going to go have fun. I'm going to compete with myself. And she won the gold medal that year because she just went there to have fun. And she said, I'm not going to compete with the gold and silver medalists who are in this game with me. I'm going to compete with myself. And that's the point of playing an infinite game. And see the difference it makes in your mindset and in your performance when you're playing that infinite game. And if you learn to play that game, you can truly have infinite avatars. That's my take on it. So changes you can make, what are the changes you can make? Shift your mindset to play the infinite game. Don't compete with the next guy, compete with yourself and beat yourself every time. Expand your network beyond your comfort zone. Invite people that may not accept your invitation and wait until they find you worthy of their network 
and then become part of their network. And once again, build a community around that, as I said to you before. Still stay vigilant about seemingly innocuous signals. I don't know if you can see that part. The innocuous signals are if you are in a company, something happens to you, like for example, I'll give you an example. I have a uh, older client, she's in her late 50s. She told me that they fired her 60 year old boss and brought somebody who was 32 years old. And she called me just a few weeks ago and she said, what does that mean? I said, it means the company is going to focus on the younger audience. So you better make sure that either you convert yourself to look like a younger audience in terms of your language and your, you know, what you do or find yourself another job and get ready for it. That's what I mean by looking at these innocuous signals. Figure out the story you tell yourself. I've said this three times. I'm saying it this for the third time here is tell your story first to yourself and then you're ready to sell that to others. Unless you sell your own story and own it, nobody's going to buy it. And learn how to make preemptive moves. Make yeah, preemptive Dilip, just a time check. Sorry, happen. time check for a couple, two more minutes left. Dilip. Yes, I, I'm, I'm almost done. I'll be done in a minute. And finally, that's my message. And I'll just show you the framework I have for the um, executive presence. It's a blog that is on posted on LinkedIn. You can go read it. it it's a fairly extensive write-up on the blog itself. But this is the framework that will allow you to develop and, and, and work on your executive presence so that it works for you. So that's my presentation. I hope that you find it useful and make your avatar work based on some of these things that I have stated here. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dilip. This is very informational. Uh, and I, I'm, I personally actually know that this stuff works, so I can vouch for that. So <laughs> appreciate your time. I appreciate your time. Okay, so. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, Anu, it's on to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarah, for, for your insightful presentation on transforming avatars based on changing times. It's, um, it's just simply brilliant. Appreciate your work and thanks for your time. Thank you. Just, um, call, me, just call me Dilip. Okay, Dilip. So with great power comes great responsibility. By now, we've all realized that disruptive technologies are the most powerful sources in the business world today. Sometimes I wonder how simple our lives were and how simple our problems, but technology has transformed how we live, how we work, how we govern, how we do everything and anything. With it comes a lot of challenges, but it brings with it fresh opportunities. So I'd like to welcome the very well-informed session host, Santosh Ankola, ASCI Silicon Valley board member and head of product at TechCrunch and Engadget, as we get into a fun and exciting conversation with Naveen Jain, CEO of Viome, founder, chairman, Moon Express, and Piyush Malik, senior VP, Spring ML, discussing all about creating a transformative change by building positive social impact. Thank you, Anu. Thanks for the introduction. Um, our exciting next session, as Anu said, is a fireside, fireside chat on exponential technologies for humanity's greatest grand challenges. In this session, we'll explore um, the exponential technologies such as AI, VR, AR, and many more that will help some of the biggest challenges in humanity, and especially in the health and life science industry. Uh, we have in our panel today uh, two marquee speakers, Naveen Jain and Piyush Malik. Uh, Naveen, if you don't know, uh, he is an entrepreneur driven to solve global grand challenges uh, through innovation. He's a founder of several mm -hmm. companies, including Moon Express, Wyomi, Blue Dot, Talentwise, Intellius, and Infospace. Moon Express is the only company in the world to have the permission to leave Earth's orbit and land on the moon with a goal to harvest planetary resources and to develop infrastructure to make humanity a multi-planetary society. Wyomi is focused on disrupting healthcare with the goal of making illness elective. Naveen is director of the board at the Singular University and XPIS Foundation. <clears throat> he recently launched a multi Million Dollar Women Safety X Prize uh, to empower women around the world. Naveen Jain has been awarded with many honors for his entrepreneurial success, including Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year, Albert Einstein Technology Medal for Pioneers in Technology, Top 50 Philanthropists of 2018 by Town & Country Magazine, 
Humanitarian Innovation Award at the United Nations, Most Admired Serial Entrepreneur by Silicon Valley, India, Top 20 Entrepreneurs and Lifetime Achievement Award for Leadership by Red Herring. Welcome, Naveen. It's a privilege to have you. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Santosh. It's a kind, very kind of Yeah, We also have Piyush Malik in our panel, our own Piyush Malik. Piyush is a startup executive, entrepreneur, broad advisor, and business transformative, transformational practitioner in the domain of engineering technologies. As senior vice president at SpringML, which is a Google partner startup that builds AI, ML, IoT, and data science solution, he helps enterprise accelerate in their journey towards AI first and cloud first digital transformation. Formerly, he co-founded and led the worldwide big data and analytics center of excellence within IBM's digital consulting business and was appointed as a member of highly selective IBM's Academy of Technology in 2015. With 25 years of corporate background, he recently ventured into the world of startups and entrepreneurship. In the spirit of community service and give back, Piyush has served on the boards of a number of professional and nonprofit organizations, including Thai, American Institute of Big Data Professionals, and ASCI, where he's the founding president of their Silicon Valley chapter. Welcome, Piyush. I'll now turn it over to Naveen and Piyush. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Santosh, for that kind introduction. And um, Naveen, it's a great privilege to be able to talk to you today. It's uh, wonderful that you are here. And I must add congratulations for winning the Lifetime Achievement Award from ASCI as well. I'm absolutely hum humbled and honored to receive the award. And just, it's an absolute pleasure to be talking to fellow engineers and really looking at how the exponential technologies are really going to be the foundations that will allow each one of us to be able to disrupt many of the things that, you know, normally you wake up in the morning and you get pissed off about it, right? Now is the time for us to actually go out and do something about it. Yeah, absolutely. So, so tell me uh, at the outset, what's the secret to your success? Yeah. And then we'll get talking about your other ventures. Yeah, so I think honestly, you know, first of all, let's just define what success really means because I think everybody has a very different idea of what success really means. You know, so to me, the success is defined simply not by how much money you have in the bank, but how many lives you've been able to improve. And with that definition, I think every one of us has a potential to be an extremely successful. And to me, I would say I'm barely on the journey at the beginning of the journey of being successful, right? have just started where I really believe one day we could save billions of people not having to suffer through chronic diseases. And to me, it's just the beginning of our journey rather than end of the journey. That's really a audacious goal. And at the same time, you know, I have known you to be a big thinker and I've seen you how you have done a lot of your previous startups. You've transcended industries in your career, uh, starting from the internet technologies, uh, where you were at Infospace, which founded Infospace, and then you went on to aerospace industry, Moon Express, and now personalized health and nutrition via Viom. So um, I just want to understand how do you do that so rapidly, different industries, and what's your learning style? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really good question, Piyush, because that is a fundamental to what every one of us should really start to embrace. The, you know, first thing is, once you become good at something, once you are an expert at something, you become, I would say useless, but what I really mean is you become incrementalist. The best you can do is to be 10% better than someone else. You can be 15% better than someone else, but you'll never be 10 times better than someone else once you're an expert. And you really need to come in from outside the industry looking in, and it's not thinking outside the box, it is thinking in a completely different box, applying the knowledge of the, you know, technology from the internet industry, applying them to uh, aerospace, taking that learning, applying that to healthcare, right? And when you do that, you challenge the foundation of what everyone has taken it for granted. And that's how you come up with a completely disruptive idea. And if I may just take two minutes, I want to come up with, you know, give you a framework that I found that myself to be very, very useful. And I'm really hoping that everyone listening to it would apply that to everything they do. And it's a framework. Anytime you want to do something, whatever that is in your life, ask yourself, why this? 
Why now? Why me? And why this is, start with saying, God forbid, I am actually successful in solving this problem. Would it actually improve the life of a billion people, 100 million people, million people, whatever the goal you have? Because you need to really say that if you are successful, is it going to move the needle before you decide to dedicate 10 years of life to do something? Because it doesn't matter what you do, it takes a total dedication for a decade to achieve something audacious. The second part is why now? And why now really means is that what you believe had changed in the last one year and what you expect to change in the next couple of years that will allow you to solve this problem now than it was possible a decade ago. If you're going to still be using a technology that was available a decade ago, then you have to believe you're not the smartest guy in the world. Somebody would have actually done it. You have to believe that things are changing in a, at a pace that will allow you to solve this problem now. And the third part really is probably the most important part. Why me? And why me is what question you are asking that is different from what everyone in the industry is asking. That means it is not about knowing all the right answers, it's about asking the right question because the question you ask is the problem you solve, right? So I'm gonna give you two examples from my last two companies and how I looked at it, right? So in the Moon Express, when we say, can we actually create a multi-planetary society? Because all 7.4 billion fellow humans are living on a single spacecraft. And if our spacecraft gets damaged, the whole humanity will come to an end. It's not about planet, planet won't survive, planet will thrive. In fact, if you look at the last time when we got hit by a large asteroid, the dinosaurs were roaming this world and dinosaurs all died. The planet thrived, planet created humans, planet actually did really well. Now, after, if humans were to die, we don't know. It may create superhumans for all we know. But my point I'm trying to make is that it is not about just us. So anyway, when I started a company, Moon Express, we said we can settle on the moon. What is the first question everyone said? He said, you know, if you're going to live on the moon, how are you going to grow the food on the moon? Right? That is not generally not a bad question, but it is a wrong question because when you ask someone how to grow the food on the moon the only solution is to find a way to grow the food now what if you were to ask a slightly different question that says why do we eat food just by asking why we eat food you realize we eat food only for two reasons to get energy and to get nutrition and you say oh can i get energy from radiation like bacteria does can we get energy from photosynthesis like plants do and what can else can be done to get energy what are the other ways I can get nutrition? Is it hydrogen? Is it oxygen? Well, there is water. Can we use water to get hydrogen and oxygen? What I'm trying to say, suddenly you have 10 more different ways of solving the problem by simply asking a different question. Same type of things happened when I started Wyom. In Wyom, we were really looking at the chronic diseases and it occurred to me that every single person in the industry is asking the same question. They want to know about the genomics, genes of every human being. They want to also know what microbes are in our gut because people are starting to realize that gut microbes have something to do with chronic diseases. And I thought, you know what, that is interesting, but your genes don't change when you develop diabetes. Your genes don't change because you gain 200 pounds. Your genes don't change when you become depressed. In fact, your genes don't change any chronic diseases that you develop. So how can a solution lie in the gene? It has to be the gene expression, right? And we say, what if? Instead of looking at the gene, we measure what they are expressing. And to me, it was like, instead of measuring who is there we let in, in your gut, we say, let's find out what they are actually doing. Because if these organisms are like human beings, you could have tens of different organisms doing the same thing or same organism doing different things in different people's gut. So just by asking a different question, it led us down the path where we are able to completely disrupt this whole healthcare industry that nobody would have believed or aerospace industry that nobody would have thought of. So that to me is a right framework. And by the way, you can apply that not just to a startup company, you can apply that to your personal life. When you meet someone, you say, why her? Why now? Why me? <laughs> and you can come up with the same answers. Wonderful, wonderful framework, Naveen. I love it. I love it. And the examples you gave really bring to life your thinking is so clear and you're so articulate. I love it. And of course, you're a great storyteller. And I really, really loved, uh, I don't know when I read, um, whether I was reading your moonshot or I saw an interview somewhere where you talked about how um, uh, there's the, the gut 
talks to the brain. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, you're going to share a little bit more about that um, a little bit? Yes, of course. So one of the things that obviously, as you can imagine, I'm not a scientist. I, I, you know, I don't understand this. So anytime I start a new company in a completely new industry, I actually apply this, a, a very specific way of learning. So if you read one book on that subject, what happens is the author's view becomes your view. So you never want to do that. So you want to read 20 books. So you have now 20 data points of how different people are looking at that problem. And then you create a 21st view, which is your own by connecting all the dots. And that view actually becomes an Uber view of what every expert has not connected the dots because everybody is looking at their own dots, right? And you actually, it allows you to connect all the dots. Another thing is everyone talks about that somehow that, you know, people have this crystal ball, people who succeed, they're able to see what is going to happen in three, four years. And that's what makes them successful. In fact, it is a complete misnomer. So here is how I've always found myself to be slightly ahead of what's happening by simply looking at what is coming out in the academic journal today, journal today is what you're going to be seeing five years from now in the real world. <clears throat> so when I said, you know, I want to really look at the, you know, in this decade, the chronic diseases. So first thing I did was, let's look at what, what are the latest cutting edge, nature, cell, what are the people talking about? What is causing these diseases? And it turns out everyone was saying that depression is caused by what's happening in your gut. Alzheimer is uh, caused by what's happening in your gut. Parkinson's start 15 years before you see the first symptom, it starts in the gut, right? And now I'm looking at all these things people call gut microbiome. I have no idea what gut microbiomes are, but I'm now convinced something's got to be done about this gut microbiome. Then I started looking and said, there are 10 companies who are doing the gut microbiome testing. So how can that be a problem? 10 companies looking at it, the problem is not solved. Either I'm a moron or they're asking the wrong question. And then I said, what are these companies actually doing? It turns out every single company was simply looking at what are the organisms in your gut. And, I, and they were hoping to figure out if two people have diabetes, this person is this organism, this person this organism, somehow they're going to be able to bring the diabetes people to non-diabetes. And I kept thinking, I said, look, this can't be true. If you look at the, you know, how many different people can do the same job, what if there are many, many different organisms that are doing the same thing? So by looking at them, it will never solve the problem. The second part that was really interesting was I said, you know, same organisms can do multiple things. So it could, in your gut, maybe doing something that is good. In my gut, it could be doing something totally bad. And it turns out that even though it was a hypothesis today, it turns out to be true. So whether you look at any organism, people like, you know, technical, this organism called Ackermansia, everyone thinks it's a probiotic and you should take it because it's good for you. In fact, it turns out in some, in some people's gut, it becomes really, really pathogenic and it causes multiple cirrhosis. It causes many other diseases. You look at C. diff, it can kill you, or C. diff can actually be really good for you producing butyrate and short chain fatty acid. So to me, the key was understanding that our gut and our brain is a bi-directional communication. And what happens in your brain affects the gut, but most importantly, nine times more signal go up than the signal come down. That means what is happening in your gut actually changes your brain. So today, some very interesting research come out, Piyush, that this gets me excited, that people were able to simply do a fecal transplant. People who had alcohol addiction and addiction went away. People who were depressed, the depression goes away. People who were anxious, the anxiety goes away, right? And now what we are seeing is even the cancer, if you look inside the cancer, there is microbes inside the tumor. And imagine if you can develop a vaccine that can not only prevent the cancer from happening, it will actually reverse and completely get rid of the cancer when it is there. So one day, if I may just summarize, in the next 10 years, we are going to get rid of cancer. We're going to get rid of the chronic diseases. And our goal really is to look at, at creating this world where being sick is truly a matter of choice, not a matter of bad luck. Now, remember the choice of words I'm using. I didn't say we will create a world when there is no one who is sick because that tells you you have that power by saying it is optional i say it is up to you i would say piyush 
Like when we do a test, we say, Piyush, don't eat broccoli. Broccoli is bad for you because your sulfide production in your gut is too high and it is not good for you. Is spinach that you think is healthy because Popeye told you it is good. Popeye was not the scientist. It is in fact bad for you right now. And it may be good for you six months from now. Right now it is bad. And you say, you know what? I'm going to eat my spinach. And that means, you know what? Being sick is a choice. I can't tell you what to do, but you can tell yourself what to do. And that to me is the key is to say, give everyone a choice of let them know what is good for them. Let them know what is wrong, uh, got wrong for them and give them a choice what they want to do with that. And that to me would be the key to the human health is that we will, each one of us will know what to do and we'll have a choice. Now, if I may just, continue on that totally different tangent thought. Even if you were to solve all these problems and you say there are no chronic diseases, won't humanity run out of things to do? <laughs> what will we do if all these problems get solved? And it turns out we will never run out of problem. You are pretty too young, Piyush, like, so I'm going to date you. Uh, you know, in my days, people used to dial into the internet using 300 baht modem, right? And that 300 baht modem is how we connected. And you can remember the sound when it connected. That was a sound of joy. <laughs> you remember, right? Absolutely. And I have to tell you here, Naveen, I will, uh, you're not dating me because uh, the very first um, link, video and audio link between uh, one location in India to another location in India, in that very first link, I was involved in that project. I was a telecom engineer at that time. So uh, it was set wow, up for wow. SBI so is- in India with Tata Telecom. So uh, you're not dating me. I totally get it. So now here is the point I was going to make was, now imagine what we are doing right now. When you and I and everyone else listening to us is communicating, I am using my thoughts. And what am I using? Speech to communicate to you. That's 300 baud modem because I it doesn't matter how fast I speak, only these many words I can get out per minute. That is the very slow way of communicating. Imagine if my brain can be connected to your brain and everyone else's brain, and we can upload all of our thoughts instantly. Why would you expect a human being to sit in the class for four years just to learn some knowledge instead of just uploading the brain and better yet, subscribing to someone's brain like Piyush, I can subscribe to your brain or Dilip's brain. So every time there is a new thought with the leap has, I subscribe to his brain, I pay him a monthly fee and all those new thoughts get uploaded. My brain now gets connected to the cloud. So not just my memory and my phone numbers and everything is now in the cloud. Now I have all my decision making being done by our AI avatars, right? So to me, one day, you know, one other thing that really, really fascinates me is my mom used to always tell me, you cannot be in two places at the same time. And I kept thinking, why does mom say that all the time? But what if, what makes you think you are in one place? Because our sensors, we call eyes, our ears, our you know, haptic sensors, my touch, and somato sensors, like all of these things are limited to the local environment. What if my brain can feel when I'm in Atlanta, I can feel, I can see, smell, and touch everybody who is in Dubai. I can feel, touch, everybody who is in Bombay. I am in three places asynchronously feeling the same thing as if I'm in all three different places. And that actually will happen because to me, there is no limitation. We are so limited by the biological gift we have. We see only a small amount of wavelength. We hear very small amount of wavelength, right? Now imagine if I told you that I'm hearing a Taylor Swift right here, you would say this guy has really gone cuckoo because there is no Taylor Swift playing. And you put a radio and you can hear it. That means sound is here. We just can't hear it. And yeah. anyone who can hear it, we think they are a cuckoo. Right? But they're not a cuckoo. Yeah. They in fact are super enabled. Right? Yeah, yeah. you're talking some things which are science fiction uh, like science fiction. And uh, I'm reminded of uh, something that I saw on perhaps Netflix, Upload. Yeah. Uh, which talked about how people can be um, have an afterlife where their entire memories are uploaded. And so the idea of subscription is like, as if you're subscribing to a YouTube channel. I really yes. love your examples and your style, Naveen. We could go on and on, but I want to make sure uh, we have some questions from the audience as well. So I'm just keeping an eye on that. And uh, 
uh, I don't uh, see anything. Well, there are people who are expressing they want to be in multiple places. But uh, before we, uh, you know, I see any other interesting question, I would want you to see if you can explain the concept of exponential technologies and the grand challenges and how you support them. Of course. Yes, yeah, so Piyush, exponential technologies are technologies that are accelerating at a pace, and you can say they double every year or they double 18 months, right? So it's a Moore's law is one of the exponential technology that says the number of transistors on a silicon would double every 18 months, right? Now, the interesting thing that's happening is we are building the technology on top of the existing technology. So acceleration itself is accelerating, right? And that is really the key. And you know, that, that thing is really how you start to see what is coming actually in the next couple of years because the exponential technologies are so disruptive that most people would never even fathom about what that really means, right? So if I were to tell you, uh, Piyush, you have two choices. I will give you a million dollars right now, or I will give you one cent today and I would double it Every, every day, I would double it for 30 days. So you'll get one cent today, two cents tomorrow, four cents next time. Everyone will take a million dollars today. And what they don't realize is when you are doubling one cent every time, by the time you go day 30, it is a $1 billion, right? So yeah. my point is yeah. human mind cannot actually understand. They understand linear. One cent, one million, I'll take a $1 million right now, right? Yeah. But they don't understand when something is doubling, it looks really nothing is happening until it hits the knee of the curve and it just takes off. And people say, oh, where did that come from, right? 3D printing is a great example. People keep talking about, oh my God, 3D printing is so new. It came out of nowhere. Well, it has been 30 years, 30 years. In fact, all of the patents on 3D, print 3D printing are all expired, right? So my point is because it was so disruptive for, you know, double, 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 and boom, it took off, right? And that happens, in, by the way, almost every digital technology. And that's the reason I felt the healthcare, the timing was now to do healthcare right, you have to digitize the human body. And that means you have to be able to take an analog sample, blood, stool, saliva, pick a name you want, and to be able to convert them into digit ACGT. Once you do that, it follows the path of an exponential curve. Then the cost of processing gets really, really easy. Now you can put them at 1,000 core at AWS, analyze the data really cheaply. Then you can use AI to be able to make sense of all of that. And suddenly the thing that was used to be on a trial and error linear path, now we've gone on an exponential path. And today we can not only predict before you have a disease, we can predict 30 different diseases. Just to give you an idea, we are less than three-year-old company. We can predict just by looking at your saliva that you are going to have a stage one oral cancer with 98% accuracy just by looking at saliva. We are doing now trials with GSK on colorectal wow. cancer. We are looking at now in all diseases like Alzheimer, autism. We are looking at disease like diabetes, heart diseases, obesity. So my point is, because once you digitize, it's not one drug, one thing, it takes 10 years. Boom, you have all the data about. Now, since we have analyzed over quarter million people, Piyush, we have the most amount of data that has ever been collected. Most trials are done on 10,000 people. We have 250,000 people. So we can literally we say, here is what causes depression, and here's what we can do. Using food as a medicine, using drug as a medicine, using vaccine as a medicine, to us, it doesn't matter. It is literally a modulate this pathway into this. Absolutely fascinating, I mean, this is, this is wonderful. And I love this quote from Hippocrates, which said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy yes. food. And that's what uh, you are talking about here. And you have actually- And he also said, yeah, inspired. all diseases begin in the gut. He said, all diseases begin in the gut. So we knew that 2,500 years ago. <laughs> Wow, wow. And, and uh, are you drawing any inspiration from uh, the ancient Indian texts as well? Because as you know, you know, father of uh, uh, plastic surgery uh, was from yeah. India, uh, ancient India. And uh, of course, in, in the modern times now, you have uh, your, I believe your CTO on uh, Vayom came from IBM, the head of yeah. uh, Bim Watson and a former colleague of mine. So say hi to him uh, from me, but uh, I want to hear that story, how you know, the ancient wisdom and modern technology, AI technologies, how you are applying in your 
uh, companies? Uh, so first of all, I think Santosh is uh, hinting us that I think we might, our time might be <laughs> too short here. So I don't know how much time do we have, but just to give you an idea, the ancient wisdom never dies. The ancient wisdom has been a trial and error for many, many generations. So it's to give you such a simple idea, you know, in India, we put butter on the bread, the ghee on the bread, right? Or we eat the bread with the butter. Why is that? The carbs have very high glycemic response, but when you put a fat on it, it reduces the glycemic response. And that's the reason we'll put the thing when we eat carbs, we always put a fat, which is called ghee in it. Now that is to me is something they learned through trial and error. Now today I can tell you with a glycemic response that when you have a bread, the carb, the fat, it actually reduces the glycemic response. So sure, we can now tell you exactly why and for who so some people it may not work and we tell you which people it will not work for which people banana is bad, which people bread is bad, but they can eat bread all they want, right? So, you know, so my point I'm trying to make is that ancient wisdom was trial and error. Now we can be very, very precise for each individual. We used to do the kappa, pita, and you know, that thing. I mean, now that was a personalized food and now we can go even more precise, but it is really the same Ayurveda culture of personalizing the food Absolutely. and someone will tell you this food is not good for you, right? Absolutely. And one more thing from Ayurveda, as well as your modern thinking yeah. is the abundance mindset and how a meditation, medication and um, microbial things can basically reduce stress and lead to better health. So, uh, Naveen, um, if you can uh, summarize in one sentence message to our audience, what would it be? First of all, my message would be dream so big that people think you're crazy and know that you only fail when you give up. So don't ever give up. Continue to uh, continue to pursue your dreams and know that everything is possible. Wonderful. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Back to you, Santosh. Thank you. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you, Piyush. I mean, we could have gone on and on the whole day, but unfortunately, this has to come to an end. Uh, there, are, there are a few questions. I think we can try to answer them on the chat. Uh, but with this amazing session, I'm truly inspired personally. I'll pass it on to Anu. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. That certainly was a fascinating journey into your mind, Naveen. Simply genius. Appreciate the work and the passion you bring to your field. Best to all your exciting endeavors. And now to the flavor of the season. The data all over the planet, threats and frauds are pretty imminent, right? Did you know that 68% of business leaders feel that their cybersecurity risks are increasing? Did you know that data breaches exposed 4.1 billion records in the first half of 2019? And that hackers attack every 39 seconds? And listen to this one. Since COVID-19, the US FBI reported a 300% increase in reported cyber crimes. And I can go on and on, but let's welcome our session host, the very talented and brilliant Sukruta Baduria, CTO, Girl Geek X, and engineering manager, Salesforce.com, to introduce our next set of panelists who will discuss the nature of cyber security industry. Over to you, Sukruta. Thank you, Anu. So like Anu said, I'm Sukruta. Uh, I'm going to be introducing our speakers for our next session. Our biggest threats are also our greatest opportunities. Cybersecurity is imperative for nations as well as corporations. We will now hear more about this from two experts, Anand Oswal and Matthew Rosenquist. We'll start with Anand. A little bit about Anand. Anand is SVP and GM at cybersecurity leader Palo Alto Networks, where he leads the company's firewall as a platform effort. He holds over 60 US patents. Welcome, Anand. Thank you. Um, so happy to be here. Uh, it's really hard to follow Naveen. It was a wonderful talk by him. I'm going to talk a little bit about cybersecurity and talk about what's happening in the industry today and, and what are things that we need to watch out for. So, you know, if you look at the industry, we're having a lot of things happening in parallel. I think in many ways, we're having some mega transitions that are really impacting enterprise IT uh, network security in a big way. The first is rise of the mobile workforce. And, you know, this has been in, in many ways accelerated immensely with the pandemic of COVID. But mobile, the, rise, the, the mobile workforce has been on rise for over a decade, right? 
uh, 80% of deaths pre-COVID as well were, uh, were deskless. So there are no, no fixed uh, uh, places for people to go in the enterprise and sit to. And with the current pandemic, this is like everybody, 100% of, of everybody of companies are remote. Businesses are happening remotely. You're getting uh, your employees working remotely, sales, everything is happening remote. So that's one big mega transition happening. The second is, I think the, the shift to, to cloud, like for all the big uh, shift that's happening to the cloud, if you look at the overall enterprise IT spend, the, all the spend in the, um, the PaaS and IS and SaaS is about 10, 15% of the overall IT spend. So for the foreseeable future, we are going to see, uh, we're going to live in a hybrid world that is going to have on-prem, virtual, and cloud. And you also seeing the big cloud providers now having solutions for on-prem, whether it's Outpost or Anthos and whatnot. That's the second big mega transition happening. The third is this whole notion of, I, I call it direct to app. And a lot of people talk about a direct to cloud, but still a lot of applications are not in the cloud or in the private data center. So I, I call it direct to app. And, and by this, what I mean is that we want to access the application, wherever the application, the best place to access the application, if in the cloud, SaaS applications, in the data center. However, one thing to note is that the expectations that we as users have is increasing. Whether you're in the headquarters, in the brand site, at home, in a coffee shop, on the road, you expect the experience that you have with the application to be the same awesome experience, no matter where you are. And that's really leading to three of these mega transition happening together. So how do you um, ensure you are having the right level of security and how do you align your princip uh, principles and the approach you have? So from a security perspective, if you think about it, if you are IT, you want to ensure that your users can access uh, the application that they want to access from anywhere, from any location, from any device. The applications, they're anywhere. They're in the cloud, they're in multiple clouds, they're SaaS applications, they're in the data center. You're accessing them over any plethora of different devices. You wanna have the best user experience, but you also wanna ensure it's fully secure. So you want consistent security and management across the, all the form factors. Whether you're in a hybrid world, you're in an on-prem world, you're having applications and data center, you have, you've fully made that, uh, that pivot to all cloud. You wanna have the consistent security, consistent policy, management across all of this. The second one is really around best in class integrated security services. Look, the security industry is the most fragmented industry we, uh, that exists today. And why is that so? I think if, we, if you rewind the clock back 25 years ago, networks were simple, right? You had a bunch of computers connected to each other and uh, connected to a server room. And what was security? Security was ensuring nobody can have access to the room where you have your server. And then the world started getting complex. You started having accessing, you, know, you have laptop and you're accessing now VPNing and accessing your resources from home. And the job of IT at that time was to ensure that the right people access the right resources. So security was still in many ways centralized in the DMZ, which is a hub and spoke architecture. What happening today is like I talked earlier is that your applications are everywhere, your users are everywhere, your devices are not all managed endpoints, which means that some of them are bringing your own devices to the enterprise. So now this, this whole fragmented nature is beginning to hurt enterprises because you wanna have the, the notion of network effect. How does, how does your um, anti-phishing or antivirus make your data protection even better? You wanna have the effect of network data. So you're looking to have this integrated platform where you can have all your services run. You want best of breed, but you also want an integrated and benefiting from each other. And the third approach that is really important is this whole unification of networking and security. If you think about it, networks built in the past, or even, even now in many ways are complex. You build a bunch of devices in your branch, you build your hubs, you build your regional hubs, you connect these regional hubs, you lease line from service providers, try to connect them together. It takes time, it takes money, it's complicated. There should be an easier way with the advent of cloud. And that's really the whole notion of how do you get networking and security combined? When the internet was first built, security was in, in, in many ways an afterthought, right? It was not something that they had thought through when they started building on the internet. And now when we have to think about how the world has to go, these, these two need to really be intertwined and connected seamlessly and not bolted on. So with that in mind, I'll, you know, I'll talk about some of the hot topics in cybersecurity today. I think the whole 
the whole notion of attackers this is the only industry where we have adversaries who are on the lookout every single day and if you talk about using ai and machine learning in your products the adversaries are using them as well 95% of all the attackers hackers that that are trying to get into these things are using ai and machine learning they're taking existing malware and they're morphing it so the traditional signature based approach of you know taking 24 hours to patch new signatures will just not work this is happening too fast so you got to go do these things in real time get machine learning into the core of the security products and leverage data uh, in a in a in a very different way so that's one the second is i think we all we all seen the hype of around 5g but in many ways is coming to realization now networks are getting rolled out but the real promise of 5g is not just for faster access to endpoints whether you buy a new iphone 12 or a new samsung galaxy phone etc is real here how service providers can use that technology to change to provide new services to enterprises how do you ensure that your factory floors your machines your mining industry manufacturing industry that in many ways were not connected these ot networks were not really connected how are they using private 5g networks to really get connected on so you want to make sure that it's just not just for the service provider infrastructure but allow them to extend their time to enterprises third is iot um we adding a million new devices every single hour yes every single hour we adding a million new iot devices every single hour majority of these or almost all of these devices in in many cases in the in the, in the enterprise are not are not provided by they are managed endpoints they come from a plethora of different manufacturers you can't update the the host os or stack or have have controls on that So how do you ensure that you are able to now provide security as these devices come into the enterprise? Over the last two or three years, majority of the big attacks which melted down parts of the internet were because of IoT devices. It's not just important to know what is the endpoint. The traditional approach has been: let me understand. This is an Apple TV. This is a sensor. This is a temperature. That's not enough because attackers are taking over control of the devices and behaving as something else. so it's important to understand what is the endpoint but it's also important to understand the behavior of that device and when that behavior changes how do you ensure that you can have automatic policy remediation most of the security problems that we have is because we have a flurry of alarms that come in and it takes days weeks months and sometimes years to understand what exactly happened so the power of ai and machine learning and all of these devices coming on we got to automate uh uh this and make it more seamless and the last one is really around helping secure remote workforce with the pandemic we've seen all of us pivot to working from home right security is paramount i i don't think that when the world opens up which i hope it will happen soon that everything will be coming back to normal you're still going to see a lot more remote workforce than you saw in the past so how do you ensure that this remote workers are secure they're accessing the right applications they're accessing things that they are compliant and and ensuring that their devices that their hosts have integrity that device posture is accurate the application that they access in the cloud they're not getting uh, uh, malware from so all of this bringing the unification of networking and security ensuring that you can provide secure remote workforce is going to be uh, an area which is going to uh, have a lot of new things coming as we see more and more uh work workforce continue to stay remote uh even after the pandemic opens with that i'll um, i'll pause i think we have matthew um <clears throat> hi everyone uh, our next speaker is matthew matthew is the chief information security officer for eclipse and has had 30 diverse years in the field of cyber physical and information security welcome matthew thank you much thank you much let me share a deck Um it's always a pleasure to talk to engineering communities uh because you've got such a great perspective and I'm here both to um let's see if it comes up uh, uh let's see if we can see that can we see that okay all well mm-hmm. All right. Um so I'm here both to uh, you know talk about the future of cybersecurity um and and to help the audience especially as we get into the discussion but also to challenge you a little bit uh because again 
everybody comes at cybersecurity from different perspectives. So it's good to kind of get some of the things reinforced and some of the ways that we think sometimes challenged. So I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes going through this and then me and Anand can, can have a great chat. Uh, and Anand talked a little bit about you know some of the changes. And again, our industry is chaotic. It's constantly changing. In fact, cybersecurity changes the same rate of technology innovation as digital technology um, you know, increases and expands and does wonderful things to connect and enrich people's lives all over the globe, well, the need for security also rises because as digital technology weaves into our lives, we get dependent on it and we enjoy those capabilities and that has value. And where there's value, well, then there's attackers not too far behind. And we have to worry about those. We do have those intelligent adversaries that are always looking to gain that advantage. And the engineering aspects of technology is crucially important when we talk about the bigger picture of cybersecurity. Now, engineering isn't the only aspect of cybersecurity. It's important. It builds the playing field. It is, you know, the foundation. However, there are many other aspects as well. And as an engineering community, we kind of have to understand the bigger picture and all of our roles as we work together to try and increase the trust in technology. So as technology rises and we all adapt to it, uh, you get these organizations and companies and so forth they want to meet those expectations of the customer, right? So security and trust and privacy and things of that sort, it's becoming a competitive advantage, which puts more uh, emphasis on the engineering to make sure that those products are coming out into the marketplace, hardened, secure, protected, and continually evolving to meet the, the threats. So, you know, it's important that, that we understand that uh, especially as we look at the long-term changes of how society is adopting uh, technology and their evolving security, privacy, and safety needs along those same paths. So on the other side, from, from an engineering perspective, you get all these challenges. Okay, we have to secure things. But again, as Naveen said, people don't want to sacrifice the usability or the functions. They don't want it to cost more or anything like that. And that creates friction. And it really raises the bar for the engineering community. And it can be frustrating, absolutely frustrating. So, so you know, it's, it's important at the end of the day that we're looking at how the bad guys attack what we use in the technologies and how those then change the expectations. If you've lost your personal data and had your finances um, you know, destroyed, all your, your, your money taken out of your bank account or your stock exchange, that will fundamentally change how you value security. And so for every attack, for every exploit for every pain that people suffer in technology when it comes to security, that then changes a little bit and eventually in aggregate what society demands. And, you know, the, the age old challenge for engineers, right? People want something fast, they want it cheap, and they want it to work real well. And, you know, pick two, right? Well, unfortunately, now with security, we add to that model. And now you add security into there. And again, people still want it cheap. They still want it fast. They still want it good. But now they also want it secure. And so that, that puts a lot more pressure on the engineering community. It really does. And it's a great opportunity, though, because it shows how engineers can step up, can solve problems, can help contribute to the greater picture of security. And that's something that the engineering community is in progress of right now. And we're seeing the very best engineers and the engineering teams embrace that. It's, it's a headache. It's, you know, you lose a lot of hair, uh, but it's also a tremendous opportunity for the growth of the engineering communities and how products are engineered. So again, you know, we see engineers moving forward in the future, making sure that there is that trust, which means privacy and security and even safety because a lot of devices today, they're not just gathering information, they're actually controlling the world. That autonomous vehicle that we all want to have, you know, it's going to be able to control the acceleration, the turning and so forth. We don't want that hacked. That's a life safety issue, right? So engineering has to, to really step up in collaboration with the risk assessment and the operations and everything else to figure out, okay, how do we intersect some of these threats? 
And every change that we look at, okay, something's coming, 5G is coming, well, there's going to be 5G and 6G and on and on and on. That continues to evolve. The threats will continue to evolve. Good engineering practices, that enhances the foundation to address all those future problems. So it's very, very important that we understand how important this community is when we talk about engineering for good cybersecurity into the future. And at the bottom line, right, we don't want bolt-on security. We want, it, we want it embedded from the architecture, design, Q&A, even before it hits the, the general populace. So hugely important. And at the very end of the day, you know, engineers, good engineers create secure products. And so that's a mindset change for, for many people in the industry. Um, and so cybersecurity, it is both an opportunity and it's also a threat. And so with that, Anand, <laughs> let's have some discussions. All right. Hey, Matthew, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. So what are your thoughts here, Anand? Um, you know, as cybersecurity evolves, and you know the the threat agents out there are constantly adapting to the technology. Um, you know we talked about AI. AI is a tremendously powerful tool, but a tool can be used for good or for bad. What are your thoughts in in how we have to evolve as an engineering community to help it be used for the good and and maybe put some controls in how it can be used for the bad? Yeah. I think that's a, that's a great question, Matthew. I think, look, I think uh, from, from a security perspective, like I said earlier, this is the only industry where we have active adversaries trying to break us down constantly. And it's never gonna stop. You're not gonna be in a world where you say, look, I'm all secure now, I can go to sleep. You're constantly looking at a variety of different threats, people looking at different um, techniques you're trying to hack in. A lot of times we spend time securing things. It's, it's like a house, right? If you have a 300, if you have 300 doors in the house and and 500 windows, all you need is like one small crack somewhere for someone to sneak in. And I think from that perspective, it's very important for us to ensure that we have not only an um, inside out perspective of how our enterprise or how our, our, our uh, situation is, but have an outside in perspective on how the hackers view the world. And then, like you said, like, look, we want to make sure that this is something that we need to use automation immensely to be able to attack. I mean, majority of the problems in, in, in cyber attacks are because of fundamentally a couple of reasons. One is that enterprises are using manual ways of doing things. So manual configurations of policies, manual remediation of things that are when they know are happening, they get alarms that they have to sort out manually. And you get like 8,000 alarms a single day and you can't distinguish on what's good versus what's bad. And it takes you weeks before you know, oh shit, what happened, right? And that's where I think we can remove, and, 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 and that's how we can help with the power of AI, machine learning, and automation to simplify that. Now, you also want to have visibility. So, yeah, you can get that visibility, but you want to automate as much as you can because it's, it's happening at a very rapid rate, as you know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, tools can be used for good or for bad. And, and especially with the automation, it helps keep pace uh, yes. with the scale of attacks. Not necessarily the innovation, right, but definitely the scale, which is is kind of that fundamental challenge that, that we have. There's an interesting question coming in. Um, and the question was, uh, will quantum computing make cybersecurity technologies obsolete? And I'd love to take a first shot at this and then, and, and then hear from you. Um, you know, quantum computing is great. It is great from a perspective of being able to solve certain types of challenges and problems. And unfortunately, some of the problems that it can solve very, very quickly are around certain ways of encryption and authentication. And so those certain algorithms out there, which are in use, um, are potentially victim to high levels of quantum computing, right? And we're starting to see some of that. But not all algorithms um, are easily victimized by that way. There are quantum resistant algorithms. In fact, NIST and other organizations are looking and evaluating because it really just becomes an evolution, which again, when you have active attackers, it's about evolution. And as attackers can bring in quantum computers to solve certain types of equations, well, we go in and re replace those with quantum resistant ones so that yeah. they can't. It's you move left, I move right. It becomes a dance. So, you know, uh, what are your thoughts? 
I, I, I completely agree with you, Matthew. And I understand there's awesome work happening with organizations like NIST to ensure we can have quantum resistant uh, algorithms, et cetera. But like you said, it's an evolution, right? I think we got to keep evolving, uh, making the algorithms we have more and more better every single day. Yeah, and, and also use different techniques. For example, when we had a lot of things around in the world move from HTTP to HTTPS, a lot of people said like, I'm not going to have visibility into what happens in the enterprise. And you found different techniques by looking at patterns and metadata, et cetera, to understand that you can still have privacy, but I can still understand what's happening from a security perspective on the enterprise. And I think that's the evolution that we will continue to have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's another question before I get into it. I want your thoughts, right? Engineers tend to look at that engineering problem, the technical problem. I need to create a perfect firewall or a perfect overlay of resources or, or look at data. What are your thoughts when it comes to the behavioral aspect in cybersecurity, right? Often I explain it to people that it's kind of like two sides of a coin. You've got technology on one side, you've got the behaviors of people on the other and the process in between. You know, in your mind, how important is it for engineers to understand who's going to be using it, how it's going to be used, how, you know, how it's going to be administered and, and the potential issues of behaviors undermining sometimes beautiful technology, but undermining the security of it. Yeah, I think uh, you had a very good point, Matthew. Look, I mean, behavior of the things of who the, the end user is, what is the persona, what they're trying to do, what is their role and what is their outcome is very important. And that's why I come back to the, to the point I mentioned. If you, if you think about it, everything that is flowing through an enterprise uh, uh, or a campus environment is flowing through security products. Right? How do we ensure that the bits and bytes of data on the network get converted to information? And how do we take this information and convert it to insights? And how do we take the insights and, and convert it to outcomes depending on what the persona is and what they want to drive? And how do you use that feedback loop then from the outcome to ensure that you can refine that outcome based on what you're learning from it? And that's the whole the feedback mechanism that we need to, to be. So we're constantly improvising from what we're learning, how we are fixing things, how we're remediating those things, and then watching for the next things happening. But it's, it's a constant, it's, it's a circle. And that circle then, does that require engineers to interface more with wetware, the people, than they have traditionally in the past? I think it, it requires the engineers to understand the outcomes a lot better. Like what is the outcome of the end user? Who is the end user? What do they care? Why do they care? And why are they doing certain things a certain way? because then they can figure out uh, more creative solutions to solve the problem. Yeah, that, that may get out of people's comfort zone, <laughs> but that's a good thing. That's a good thing. We all have to adapt. I see another question coming in. I know we're running short on time here. Um, so let's take this last question, then we'll hand it over and, and get back on schedule. So the question is, how do you handle cyber risks coming from vendors or other third parties? So suppliers, um, partners, uh, vendors, things of that sort. That's a, that's a very important question. And if you look at my uh, hot topics, the last one I talked about is the unification of networking and security. And what that means is basically you want to have people are coming and accessing resources from, uh, from all, all possible outcomes. So for example, you have people in the headquarters, you have people in the branches, you have people accessing it from home, from managed endpoints, which means company provided laptops or phones from unmanaged endpoints means I'm bringing my own, because all my applications are SaaS applications, I'm bringing my own laptop, my own phone. And then you have partners and vendors wanting to access certain applications. So you wanna have, so that's the reason why it's a platform approach, right? You have all of these access technologies or access or methods of access. And then you have to have a platform approach of ensuring that you can provide security across all of these because all of the users that I talked about from all the different places they're in, they're also accessing applications that are everywhere. They're no longer in one place. They can say, okay, come in, I'll check your, your passport and see if you are allowed to enter inside. No, it doesn't happen that way. I'm, I'm accessing applications in data center, in the cloud, multiple cloud, SaaS applications, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why you need this platform approach. And then you want the effect of network, the network effect of data, what I like to call, where you're making, you're, you're making the what the industry calls as patient zero attack, right? This is known as for a while in security where I don't like to use the word, but it's around the first person gets infected and now I want to ensure that other people don't get infected. Our job is to ensure that nobody gets infected. Like how do you ensure that it's, and, and that's where we can do it by when you get, when you do things in line. The moment you have to send something to the cloud for processing and then send signatures down, that makes it, that's going to be a delay and lag. 
So how do you do most of what you do in line? And you have to always do some processing behind the scenes. Yeah. And, you know, when I sit down, I talk with boards or, or CISOs, especially about third party risks. It all starts, uh, you know, with the organization security policy, because that really defines what your risk accept acceptance is. And any time that you're sharing data with third parties, they are now part of your chain. And the weakest link is, is what you got to worry about. So whatever your security policies and posture is for your people, your technology and your processes, it really needs to translate over. You need to take the responsibility of working with those vendors and suppliers and partners to make sure that they take their security just as seriously as yours so that there is no weak link. And it's not easy. There's a lot of discussion about it. It's not just creating a rule uh, and it's not just a legal form. It takes a little bit more in depth to be able to make sure that your partners are with you in this journey for cybersecurity. So, yes. and I see that, that we're out of time here. So I'm gonna hand it back over. Thank you so much, Matthew and Anand. That was very insightful. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, you, Anu. Thank you, Sukrita, Anand and Matthew. Very informative and insightful session and the need of the hour. Appreciate your work and thanks for your time. Um, Let's move on as we uh, start thinking about innovation. It's truly a confusing buzzword, which many people love to hate. Every business leader agrees that it's important, but nobody can quite seem to agree on what it actually is or what it means. Just give you a quick test. Go to Google, type innovation in your search engine. You'll get over 300 million results, thousands of definitions. So allow me to invite the very energetic Rakesh Guliani, ACEI Silicon Valley board member, entrepreneur, and vice president at Park Computer Systems to unleash the whole process of innovation in an enterprise with the help of our experts, Mr. Manoj Prasad, VP and Global CTO, Thermo Fisher Scientific, and Mr. Prakash Kota, CIO, Autodesk. Over to you, Rakesh. Hey, Anu, thank you so much for the great introduction for me, as well as for our speakers. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the Innovation in the Enterprise session. I'm your host, Rakesh Guliani, Vice President, Park Computer Systems, a technology consulting and staffing firm based out of Bay Area. Thank you so much for joining us. Even before the global pandemic hit us, enterprises were working hard to constantly innovate and become nimble and agile to address their users and customers' needs, and we're driving efforts to enable their customers and users with better tools. How has this pandemic changed the pace of innovation in enterprise technology? How is the technology evolving due to this pandemic? Today's industry leaders are designing strategies and leading innovations to improve the experience of the users, but how? That's what we are going to explore in our today's session, and joining me now to talk about this and more is Prakash Kota, CIO of Autodesk. Apart from accelerating Autodesk digital transformation and customer-centric approach by providing customers and employees world-class experience, Prakash has been hosting CIO exchanges and contributing to CIO Magazine, Forbes, Wall Street CIO Journal, and CNBC about strategies on digital transformation. Hello, Prakash. Good to have you here. Good to be here, Rakesh. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And also joining us today is Manoj Prasad. Manoj is Vice President and Global Chief Technology Officer at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Manoj has been a speaker in many technology forums and has been featured in Computer World, CTO Forum, Network World, and many other leading publications. Nice to see you, Manoj, and welcome. Thank you, Rakesh, great to be here. Awesome. So before we dive into hearing from our speakers, we would like the audience to know that we would love to hear from you and you can put your questions on the chat on the right side of your screen and we will take as many questions as time permits towards the end of the session. I know it's hard to follow on what uh, Naveen Jan had to say, what Anand Oswal and Matthew's discussion, uh, but we will bring all the innovation in spotlight here with uh, Prakash and Manoj. So let's take it with Prakash at this time. Prakash, how are the companies like Autodesk managing the employees and customer demands during these tough times and how are you leveraging technologies to meet COVID related issues and demands? Yeah, no, thank you. 
I think COVID definitely hit all of us by surprise. And overnight, we had to switch globally. Uh, companies had to switch globally to go remote. And for those who don't know about Autodesk, we make software so that our customers can make anything. So we are a design company. Uh, about three years back, we started a transformation uh, to move to a subscription model. When I joined the company about 15 years back, we used to ship DVDs to our customers. And uh, our software requires a predominantly desktop-based software requiring heavy GPU intensive workloads. And now we provide access to our software in the cloud. And uh, it's no more, uh, it's no more uh, uh, giving us uh, shipping DVDs. I would say it's all about giving access to the, uh, in the cloud. And being a subscription company in this time probably is a phenomenal mode for us to be in. So I would say uh, we were able to do it without uh, losing a beat like many other companies uh, because we were well into our whole digital transformation. Uh, and when we say digitization, right, again, it's a buzzword <laughs> as you guys were all talking about a lot of buzzwords today. But I think from our standpoint, when we say digitization, it's all about removing friction for users, whether that be employees, customers or partners. And so that has been a huge focus for us in the last two to three years. And that definitely helped us to really, uh, during this whole COVID situation, where we, had, uh, we were able to switch overnight and our employees and customers are still being effective and productive. Yeah, that's awesome. From DVD all the way to uh, everything online, quite a transformation. Uh, so Manoj, uh, and uh, how is Thermo Fisher Scientific the company that's right in the center of COVID specific solutions, managing the customer's demands and what all products is it working on? Yeah, Rakesh, um, uh, you know, some of you uh, may not know uh, much about Thermo Fisher because we kind of run a little uh, under the radar. Uh, we are a $27 billion company and um, basically focused on DNA sequencing machines, uh, lab equipments, uh, you know, electron microscopes and other uh, millions of products that we sell. Um, and when you talk about COVID, I don't think there is any other company like us uh, because we are the gold standard for COVID testing, the PCR testing that is done across the world. We are the one like, you know, who are market leaders in that. And then when it comes to uh, drugs and vaccines, we are the one who uh, basically uh, helps companies uh, who has an idea about a drug uh, to make the molecules out of the chemicals. And if that molecule looks like uh, a potential uh, um, you know, drug, then we help them uh, uh, with clinical trials. And uh, if the trials are successful, we then get involved in, um, in helping them uh, you know, manufacture and distribute. So some of the uh, COVID-related drugs today you see in the market with other brand names is actually manufactured and distributed by us. Um, and then like, you know, when you have vaccines, it needs cold storage. Uh, who provides the refrigerators uh, with minus 40 and minus 80 degrees? It's again Thermo Fisher, right? Um, so when you look at uh, Thermo Fisher, uh, we are involved in pretty much everything that you can talk about, including selling the PPEs, whether it is masks, the gloves, the, the sanitizers. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, with all this kind of like, you know, being involved in, um, it becomes uh, a, a challenging time for us, um, especially uh, with respect to the demand that we have, right? You know, what we are actually trying to do to help our customers is try to bring speed and scale. That is the two things that we really want because we've been asked overnight uh, to increase the capacity 15 to 20 times. You know, we typically used to um, have like a million um, uh, test kits and now we have to like, you know, scale up to 15 to 20 million a week uh, testing uh, uh, kits, right, which um, was uh, a, a uphill task. And we had to do it uh, as fast as we could. And uh, we were able to do it successfully uh, leveraging technology because, you know, um, the whole process automation, uh, the whole IoT, you know, leveraging immersive technology because we can travel. Um, and then, of course, like, you know, some of the machine learning and deep learning skills that we had in-house was put into place uh, to, like, you know, bring the speed and the scale. Um, so we still have uh, some ways to go uh, as to how we can demand, uh, how we can meet the, the bigger demand of the world to make it healthy, uh, but we are making great progress. 
Awesome. So good to know about Thermo Fisher. Uh, I was definitely aware of them uh, helping with the testing kits. Uh, they were producing over 5 million in the very first month. Uh, but I wasn't aware of uh, you know, Thermo Fisher helping companies with the vaccines and even now uh, taking on the responsibility of delivery because we are very familiar with Pfizer, Moderna kind of companies uh, uh, you know, requiring uh, minus 40 degrees, 70 degrees uh, freezers. So that's amazing to know. Uh, so moving on uh, you know, uh, to Prakash, how is the technology innovation evolving due to this pandemic? I think irrespective of this pandemic or not, I think the technology evolution has definitely accelerated. Uh, it doesn't take any more uh, months or years for a technology to be adopted or to be divested. There are gone are those life cycles where we do projects for years or months with, uh, uh, which takes, remember those ERP implementation that used to take 18 months to 24 months, gone are those days. Now people are expecting things over demand on demand so when you think so the whole notion of how do we really get things immediately and get it in the hands of consumer is so quick so i would say the whole agile nature of how we innovate things have accelerated and at autodesk too we are we are definitely exploring a lot of things uh, from consumerization and digitization standpoint and definitely leveraging a lot of data to ensure that we are getting uh, in the right capabilities to the right users. Got it. How about you, Manoj? How, how is it involved in uh, the technology innovation happening at uh, Thermo Fisher uh, in your IT world, maybe? Yeah, Rakesh, um, the way I will uh, explain is that, you know, split this question into two, right? One is um, the whole innovation process has changed. You know, this has uh, evolved uh, during this pandemic because, you know, uh, when you are talking about um, innovation, you are observing your customers, you're doing brainstorming, you're doing collaboration, you're doing experimentation, you know, all these used to be in person. Now with this COVID and uh, people unable to travel, we had to kind of start, uh, uh, you know, taking advantage of technologies like immersive, uh, you know, AR, VR and, and MR technologies, uh, to like, you know, do this innovation. Uh, honestly, uh, you know, we are yet to figure it out how well we are doing in this, uh, you know, remote virtual innovation, uh, but our intensity and scale has increased because we are in the business where we are being asked to develop new products every day. You know, every day we are um, kind of uh, coming up with new solutions uh, you know, whether it is in testing, whether it's helping our customers come up with um, a better vaccine um, or it is like, you know, to help them with, uh, with drugs, right? So, uh, so that is one piece, how the innovation process is working. And then the other is like, you know, the actual innovation, as I said, um, uh, we, we believe uh, that um, many companies uh, that I've been talking to has uh, slowed down on innovation, especially the disruptive innovation. Uh, but when you look at Thermo Fisher, we have been on the other side of the equation just because of uh, uh, the work that we do. Um, and um, I do believe that, um, you know, the, the, the innovation that we are doing, especially in the, in the testing space, uh, is a game changer for the world. Um, and um, you will see more and more um, uh, products coming in uh, from Thermo Fisher. Um, and uh, we are uh, going to do this innovation uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that like, you know, has never been done before. Uh, so we are still kind of figuring out and learning, uh, but there is like, you know, definitely a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of vision, for sure. That's good to know. So follow up on this. Do you think has the innovation and the technology priorities changed due to, due to this pandemic uh, over at Thermo Fisher? Yes, absolutely. Look, uh, you know, the, the original plan before Corona or COVID, uh, we were looking at uh, leveraging data. We wanted to, uh, you know, focus on uh, uh, machine learning, um, artificial intelligence, um, and, uh, and, and deep learning. Uh, but because this COVID happened and we had to release products, we had uh, a, a, a instrument that was released like four months back, uh, exactly in the middle of the pandemic, uh, that was going to increase the testing to 8,000 uh, per day on a single machine, right? And uh, 
and we wanted to do that, um, we could not go to the customer site, install the machine, and um, uh, you know put put uh, the training and, and and remote diagnostics in place. So we had to quickly move into immersive technology, and that became a priority for the next uh, 12, 18 months. We believe uh, we will be really focused on that, and we have almost 40, 50 projects right now in the pipeline um, uh, to not only like you know uh, install all these instruments that we have to install globally, uh, and we're all doing this uh, leveraging Microsoft technology uh, whole lens, and then uh, we are using Microsoft uh, technology guides uh, to provide them, uh, you know, remote training and also uh, do the remote diagnostics when, like, you know, they need help because these are all new instruments. So we're able to do all this uh, uh, leveraging immersive technology. And then the most important thing is that, you know, all these uh, are validated systems. We need FDA's approval. Now, you know, because of travel restrictions, FDA is unable to travel to our site. So we had to leverage these technologies, created a POC uh, so that um, the FDA auditors can sit in their home and walk into um, you know, this virtual world of our lab and audit the whole lab uh, to a point they can like, you know, even read um, uh, you know, the barcode on a, on, a, on a test tube so that like, you know, they can really look into how the whole process is working and, and, and validate and approve our, our testing kits. Um, so innovation uh, you know, is, is all more focused now onto immersive, which we thought would be something that we would plan in 23, 24, because there was yeah. like you know, at least a couple of disruptions that was going to happen in immersive technology. You know, one is the 5G coming in. The other one is like you know, companies like Apple and others are coming up with um, you know, glasses um, with compute happening in, in, in uh, adjacent devices like cell phone, rather than having this big glasses like HoloLens where all the compute happens in the glasses. So, so there's going to be disruptions, but we have no choice but to get into this technology uh, now and uh, help our customers. Wow, that's amazing work happening at Thermo Fisher. Let's take it over to Prakash. Prakash? How is the static now? Are you guys hearing, still hearing background noise? Prakash, love noise. Oh, yes, I we are actually, unfortunately. unfortunately. Yeah, I, I, I'm hearing it clear and uh, sound and clear, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, let's see how Prakash, it works. you want to call me? Uh, okay, I can call you. Uh, why don't you start, continue with Manoj? Yeah. Yeah. Call. Yeah. Let's take let's take on with uh, with uh, Manoj uh, while you uh, resolve the the glitch that you are having. So Manoj, uh, has the intensity of innovation changed due to this pandemic, and um, how will this continue the innovation part uh, in the new post COVID era? You know, um, the intensity uh, when it comes to companies like us. Absolutely, it has increased many folds. Uh, but when you look at um, you know other companies who are kind of like you know struggling right now uh, uh, with, with their businesses, uh, I, I do talk to a few of them. Uh, they have kind of slowed down to ride this pandemic so that like you know uh, they they manage their cost. Um, uh, from from their official perspective, um, when I look at um, you know what is happening, uh, we um, believe um, we are um, you know. Um, uh, lo looking at um, uh, different aspects of um, of um, innovation, um, you know, uh, where do we go from, um, you know, immersive into uh, machine learning or or deep learning, and how do we leverage like you know these technologies? So we have, um, you know, to give you an example, uh, we we have a lot of customers who are doing um, uh, stem cell research um, and. Um, mm -hmm. You know, part of the process is to um, you know get a donor and then uh, pick up the cell. And the whole process of identifying a good cell uh, that, like you know, can be replicated and then reprogrammed and engineered and then put back into the to the patient um, uh, takes almost a year and a half. Um, you know, leveraging uh, uh, deep learning and uh, you know parts of artificial intelligence process, uh, we are able to like you know do this work in hours. So you can imagine like, you know, the kind of innovation uh, that has impact on, on, on the work that we are doing, uh, uh, which like, you know, changes um, the, the world perspective, right? You know, so the world uh, which is struggling with, um, you know, deadly diseases like cancer and others, uh, we feel like, you know, we will be able to speed up many of these um, uh, discoveries um, and, um, 
you know, uh, so for us, um, the innovation is at the top gear and, and we have to like, you know, just constantly um, uh, do this every day. Okay, you have a question for Prakash? I think Rakesh froze. <laughs> Rakesh, you are frozen? So, so. Okay, so, so yeah, sorry. Uh, so, you know, I think it looks like Prakash is uh, back. You know, his audio problem is gone. So, uh, uh, we have two minutes left. So, uh, Prakash, what technology areas are you going to focus uh, in the next uh, one years? I think that there's a huge focus on leveraging AI and ML in advance, taking advantage. Again, when we talk about AI and ML, it's all about leveraging data. And how do you first understand about your customers better and leverage AI and ML to get insights and how do you convert insights to actions? I think that, I mean, we saw the previous speakers talk about it too. I think that's another thing that you'll see. So that's the other thing that you will see uh, with leveraging of AI. Uh, how do you convert the whole data that you have and a wealth of information into insights and how do you take that insights into actions? So that you can give that preferences, recommendations, you can consumerize the overall experience in enterprise. That will be a huge focus for us. While of course protecting uh, the customer's data and information, there is always going to be a balance of how do we consumerize their experience and at the same time, maintain that enterprise security. And whatever we can use in that sense, uh, whether you call it innovation or whatever it could be, I would say continuous capability. If being a cloud company, that's something that we'll continue to focus on. Got it, got it. So uh, we, are, we are almost about uh, at the end of our session. I have a quick question from uh, one of uh, uh, the audience. How has Autodesk used automation as a key innovation technology to enhance its employee experience in the enterprise during this pandemic. So you have one minute, Prakash, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I think automation is the key. At the end of the day, if we need to hide complexity, automation is what you will need to focus on. If you need to consumerize the experience and keep it super simple, then at behind the scenes, you need to really focus on a lot of automation. And that's exactly what we have done over time. And uh, from onboarding to giving access to the right people at the right time and not needing to log in for several of the applications over a VPN, but you definitely have multi-factor authentication. So you know that we are secure and you can log in from any of your devices from wherever you are. I think we were able to tap into all of those things with our investment on what we did and uh, putting a lot of focus on automation and anything repetitive. We have a huge focus on removing all of those repetitive tasks, leveraging bots, AI, RPA, and whatnot. So I would say automation continues to be a huge focus for us. And uh, we okay. continue to see a lot of benefit, and that's an ongoing journey. Got it. Thank you for that. Today, we heard from our very distinguished guests, one coming from a leading global software company and the other one from a global life sciences company right in midst of COVID uh, solutions. Two very different industries, but tackling very similar problems in very innovative ways. Manoj and Prakash, thank you so very much for your time and insights today. And with that, I hand this back to you, Anu. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for the wealth of information. Appreciate all your time and all your efforts in your fields. You know, as a child, we all looked at the sky and beyond and asked innumerable amount of questions, right? To the point as to whose face is on the moon, right? Convincingly, we get an answers like it's an old lady. And then they don't stop there because they further say that it's an old lady spinning thread on her spinning wheel. <laughs> well, there starts our curiosity and flash forward to the present. Worldwide robots are appearing in factories and other workplaces. Used correctly, they can quickly complete repetitive tasks or operate in environments where humans can't. But robots aren't just found here on Earth. They're also essential for the exploration of space. So quick trivia for all you intelligent folks. Let's see who gets this. Um, what is the first humanoid robot called? And when was it in space? It was NASA's garment invention of the year. 
All right. Please welcome our session host, Santosh Ankola, ASCI Silicon Valley board member and head of product at uh, TechCrunch and Engadget, who will be joined by a remarkable robotics and space scientist, Dr. Shrija Nag of NASA, Bay Area Environmental Research Institute, Barry, and Neuro AI. Santosh, the screen is all yours. Thank you, Anu. Our next session is personally my most uh, exciting session. It's on robotics in space, on the current trends and future. So in this session, we'll explore uh, what's in store for humans in the aerospace and robotics industry. We are privileged to have our distinguished speaker, Dr. Srija Nag. Welcome, Dr. Srija Nag. Dr. Srija Nag um, is a senior research scientist at NASA Ames Research Center, uh, which is contracted by Bayer Institute, where she serves as a PI on D-Shield. And D-Shield is a distributed spacecraft with heuristic intelligence to enable logistical decisions. She also leads autonomous systems engineering at Neuro, a Silicon Valley startup that is building and deploying what could be the first self-driving robotic fleet on public roads. Neuro is already a unicorn company and recently received a 500 million funding. Uh, Srija completed her PhD in space systems engineering from the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at MIT, Cambridge. Her research interests include um, distributed space systems, space robotics for Earth observation, space traffic management, and vehicular robotics validation. A warm welcome, Dr. Nag, and over to you. Thank you, Santosh, for the very generous introduction. I hope you can hear and see me, and I will try to share my slides so that I can show some pretty pictures along with uh, my talk. We can hear and see you. Awesome. Can you also see my slides now? No, probably not. Not yet. Not yet. Now? We can yes. see your screen now. Yep. Great. Thank you. So, uh, so Santosh already uh, explained my formal introduction. Um, I have uh, the privilege of being a part of two great uh, institutions, uh, both NASA Ames Research Center and uh, Neuro AI, which also happen to be about 10 minutes driving distance from each other. Um, I get to be a part of research and development adventures, not just in the government, but also um, actual state scale deployments uh, in, in the industry. Um, so a bit about myself and how I got here. Um, I finished up my undergraduate studies back in India in IIT Kharagpur, uh, came straight to Cambridge, Massachusetts in 2009, uh, where I finished up my dual master's and a PhD at MIT and um, flew to the Bay Area in the summer of 2014 and I've been here ever since. Um, over the course of the 13-ish years uh, in the US, uh, I've been uh, a part of uh, three NASA centers, starting with JPL and then Goddard on the, on the East Coast and now uh, Ames Research Center. I've also spent a couple of months in the European Space Agency where I was an international fellow and a few years consulting with two space startups here in the Bay Area called Swarm Technologies and Spire. Uh, so today I'll try to draw some parallels between robotics applications and challenges on the earth and in space. So um, a little known fact about, about space missions is that uh, every space mission we've ever done is some level of robotics. To understand what that means, let's look at the full stack of a robot first. And the first module is localization, uh, where the robot tries to understand where am I? Uh, the second is perception, where the robot tries to understand what else is around me and what are they doing. Uh, the third is once they know that, they try to predict what these other agents around themselves are doing. And then based on all of that information, the robot plans what it will do um, based, based on all this information, excuse me. Um, and finally, when all of this is complete, the robot controls itself, which is actually implements um, logistically whatever it planned to do. Now, this full stack repeats at a regular cadence in every robot, whether it's a self-driving car on Earth or the Curiosity rover on Mars, or even satellites orbiting different planets. So vehicular autonomy is, is whether it's for robots or for satellites or for rovers, is defined by how much we can do with as little human in the loop contact as possible. 
So for those of you who are familiar with five levels of autonomy in self-driving, uh, this is a quick recap. Uh, you have level one, which is uh, uh, driver assistance, where everything is on. Uh, you have a level two, which is partial automation, then level three, which is uh, conditional automation, and level four, higher automation, and level five is, is full automation. The same concept also ap applies to Martian rovers, whether you believe it or not. Um, it applies to rockets. It uh, as, as you can see here, uh, a GSLV rocket lifting off uh, the, the soil of India. It applies to humans um, carrying, uh, spacecraft carrying humans. For example, you see in the picture here, there is the Crew Dragon by SpaceX. And even spacecraft that don't carry humans, they have a ton of automation on there. So these spacecraft don't carry humans, but they carry instruments to study the Earth, other planets, or even the universe. So what you see in the picture here is the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, that uh, that image the life and death of thousands of stars as in the in the decades that it's been flying in space. It's helped pin down the age of the universe, which is now known to be about 14 billion years, um, which is about roughly three times the age of the Earth. And it also created the first 3D map of dark matter and many such things. And it was possible because in part due to the automation inside inside Hubble. So robotics and autonomy uh, end up applying to all of this from, from spacecraft to these rockets and, um, and, and these instruments. So you're, you're probably thinking, well, why do these missions need to be robotic? That's because rovers on other planets or satellites orbiting the earth or rockets, they don't always have contact with humans fast enough that they need to make uh, time critical decisions. For example, any spacecraft orbiting the Earth, usually in low Earth orbit, can see any point on Earth for about 10 to 15 minutes at a time. And this happens every two-ish hours if that point is near the poles, and every few days if that point is near the equator. Which means that these satellites are pretty much on their own in between those contacts with the Earth. Um, so if you put ground stations in 20 such locations, it gives any satellite an access every four to six hours. And so the satellite has to do its own low-level intelligence, low-level planning, and everything else on its own for 46 hours at least. And so that's already level three automation in self-driving based on the previous chart. Now, higher level command and control, so when I'm thinking level four, level five, like what instruments to use and when to take a photo, what do you take a photo on, all of that still relies on human intelligence. So these humans uplink what the satellite needs to do every four to six hours. So that's level four automation onward, and that's the part that we're trying to solve. Now, keep in mind that the ground station game itself is changing. So I said 20 ground stations around the world, that's going to go up very soon because there's industry entrance now. For example, Amazon is planning to plant satellite reception terminals on many of their warehouses and then piping the collected data into their um, AWS cloud. But that's a long way to go before four to six hours begins to become minutes. And by that time, using all of those humans to support those ground stations themselves may not be very efficient. So we have to go the autonomous route anyway. So increasing levels of automation from level four upward on rovers or satellites is harder than it is on Earth because space is extremely resource constrained. Um, and the way I'd like to think about the five parameters that constrain resources are C3PO for the Star Wars fans out there. Um, so C3PO stands for constraints in communication, power, pointing, propulsion, and operations. So I already told you about the communication problem that humans get to talk to spacecraft anything between six hours to many days. Uh, the other big constraint is the compute power. Now power on, in the spacecraft is obtained from batteries charged by the sun using solar panels. And this is a problem because if the satellite is orbiting the earth every couple of hours, there's a charge and discharge cycle every couple of hours. And this impacts the lifetime of the battery. So we have to carry spares for redundancy. And you know that launch to space is extremely expensive to adding mass is, is not a good thing. And so we're very power constrained. Moreover, computer boards in space um, have to be radiation hardened so that cosmic rays and other solar particles that hit it don't cause bit flips or you know, even worse a breakdown. So um, it's hard enough flying a computer in space that's able to do the AI. And just like we have interconnected cars on Earth, we also want to have networked AI across many satellites in space. But this itself is also very hard to uh, implement because of onboard resources. Um, power constraint, we have uh, enough energy in most satellites only to power a 50 watt bulb, which is less than the amount of light we get in our bathroom. 
and enough memory to run like a Nokia old phone from 2005. Think about iPhone X having 15 times more compute power than that. And that's what we got to use in space to, to do all of the stuff that I was talking about. There's other problems like dynamics or pointing. Um, so to stabilize the system in, in space, we need, uh, we need to be able to very, be very stable in microgravity um, and then, uh, or free fall, not really microgravity. Um, and there's a lot of co private companies working on this. Propulsion and operations is all about rockets and mission operations, which you all have seen much more in the media, problems that are being currently addressed by PSLB launches in India, SpaceX in the US and so on. Um, so I talked a lot about the constraints and the costs. So let's talk a little bit about the benefits of robotics in space. Better robotics improves our ability to manufacture in space rather than haul these fully made systems on really large rockets. So we can mine resources on the moon, asteroids, or maybe even other planets by utilizing resources available there instead of taking everything from Earth. And this is called ISRU or in situ resource utilization. Uh, NASA started the process many, many years ago and private players like the Moon Express here in the Bay Area have been pushing those boundaries for a decade now. Um, better re robotics also improves inspection and servicing of existing satellites so that we can fix faulty satellites instead of having to fly a whole brand new one to space. So a little known fact, the Hubble Space Telescope that I talked about earlier that uh, pinned down the age of the universe, it had a faulty lens when we first flew it. So it couldn't take photos as needed and it would have been a waste of a billion dollars of taxpayer funds um, unless it was fixed. So a crew of astronauts actually went to the Hubble Space Telescope 500 kilometers from the Earth and fixed it. It was costly, it was risky, um, but it was worth it because Hubble ended up doing decades of science that we couldn't have gotten otherwise. But in the future, maybe robots could be fixing these, uh, these satellites instead of having to spend uh, money and risk astronaut lives to do it. So pictured on the slide are two projects. Um, the first one is RSGS, which is the robotic servicing of geo satellites that was funded by DARPA and a private company here in the Bay Area called Space Systems Loral was going to use robotic arms to fix satellites, their geo satellites in space. And another project is a smaller one called Spheres. Um, it's one of the programs, uh, one of the programs on Spheres is something I used to lead when I was a graduate student as, at MIT. And Spheres, the little satellites you see in front of the astronaut is uh, a robotic test bed inside the International Space Station, which tests new algorithms in free fall with the help of astronauts. So you can see that you know, from industry down to academia and even government, uh, robotics research is a, is a pretty big deal for applications. Um, in the last uh, few years, I've spent a lot of time on robotic satellites for environmental monitoring, um, climate change, um, making sense of the ecological uh, problems that are happening here on Earth. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that now. So by making every satellite maneuverable in three degrees of freedom so that it can point its instruments in any direction at once, uh, we're no longer restricted to that 10, 15 minutes of horizon time of viewing that I was talking about. So not only does this help comms so that you know, ground stations can talk to satellites for a longer time, it also helps the ability to monitor any location on Earth. So what you see in the figure on top here is that the same satellite is pointing to neighboring tiles. Of course, it's out of scale because it's a cartoon. Um, pointing to neighboring tiles as it zips over every couple of hours in orbit. So it's able to do that because it can point completely autonomously. And um, you can do even better as you have more than one satellite in space. Um, and in the second figure, what you see is that you can improve such robotics even more by putting inter-satellite links on board. So the satellites can then talk to each other. Now keep in mind, this is not easy to do. And I said before C3PO, communication is one of the bottlenecks of you know, robotics in space. This is not easy to do because these satellites can be thousands or even tens of thousands of kilometers apart. So power beaming and pointing is a big challenge. But inter-satellite links like the cartoon you see here has been demonstrated with lasers in the past by NASA and now private players like BridgeSat in Boston. Um, and these technologies help many applications because it enables the satellites to en monitor environments like floods, soil moisture, wildfires, clouds, vegetation, you name it, uh, depending on what instrument you want to fly. Now, outside of compute and comms and you know, the rest of C3PO, environmental monitoring presents another whole new challenge to space architecture, which aren't so bad here on Earth, but are pretty bad uh, up in space. First, the contact map between the satellites is very dynamic. 
which means which satellite can see which ground point and which other satellite at any given point of time is constantly changing. It's somewhat predictable because we've gotten really good at analytical and numerical physics of astrodynamics, but the earth isn't a perfect sphere and the satellites have to be good at checking deviations from our solutions on their own in space and correct communication accordingly. Next, there's a trade-off in um, um, in between seeing better and seeing more. So we call this uh, resolution versus coverage. And you've seen this in your cameras very often because wide angle gives you coarser pixels, but you get to see more. So you have to pick your zoom accordingly. So in space too, pointing far away helps monitor better, but at the cost of image quality. Um, the third thing is that satellites also optimize for instruments that they use for various applications. For example, measuring methane is very different uh, than measuring rain. So methane uh, measuring needs a 50 kilogram radar instrument. Rain needs uh, a different type of radar instrument. Monitoring fires need a different type of infrared or thermal instrument, um, different wavelengths, different requirements. And so we have to really think about what we want to do before we design, develop, and fly that instrument. And moreover, even the space-time requirements for every application is different. So if you want to monitor monthly deforestation in tropical rainforests, we need satellites that can see all these rainforests at least once a month uh, with instruments that can zoom into these tree patches. If you want to monitor greenhouse gases, then you want uh, satellites to be able to zoom closer to factories at night and, and things like that. So very different instruments depending on what the, the focus is. Okay, so lots of smart satellites in space are great, but they also cause a lot of traffic and may have accidents. Um, and it's not easy to clean up um, the space uh, around us like it is to clean up the roads on Earth. Uh, so any debris created by accidents stays in space forever. And this has happened a couple of times in the past and it hasn't looked pretty. So right now, we not only have around 2,000 active satellites, we also have more than 20,000 pieces of debris in space that's dead junk floating around in space. And these pose a collision hazard to these existing satellites. And if you're following the news on um, these mega constellations that are soon going to come online by SpaceX or Amazon or other new players, this problem is going to just get worse. And so just like managing traffic uh, on the road or in the air, we've started a project called Space Traffic Management, which is managing traffic in space. And I won't go into this in much detail, but in the past couple of years at NASA Ames, we've built a prototype for an STM system, a space traffic management system, using microservices architecture to level the playing field so that more private players can enter this industry, which I believe will enormously increase as space traffic continues to increase. So on the robotic side, we will continue to solve these challenges uh, as, the, as each part of the stack that I talked about and the full system. Um, localization is addressed by what we call space situational awareness research, better GPS, better algorithms to estimate where we are and what we're doing, um, better ground-based radar and optical radar to, um, and optical sensors, sorry, to track uh, satellites in space. Um, and a number of commercial players in this module alone, localization and space situational awareness has exploded. For example, Leo Labs that's here in the Bay Area, um, as of last week secured a really great long-term contract with the government uh, to do many of the actions that earlier JSPOC or the Department of Defense used to do. Next is perception addressed by leaps in observations and image processing, making inferences using better AI, better neural networks. And perception software is of course, like I said, a, a function of the application and what instrument you fly. So whether it's agriculture or floods, your instrument will have to change and so will your perception software algorithms. Uh, prediction is actually even more sensitive to applications and we are developing different technologies to predict hurricanes um, and, and floods so that we can plan better. Planning algorithms are fairly importable from self-driving cars. So you can hear the usual suspects for optical planning for um, cars and R&D spheres in, in our labs is the same. Um, and then finally, uh, there is controls, which is to make these satellites uh, do what they, uh, they should be doing and, and point in the right direction, their instruments. And so this is a little cartoon that one of my students made uh, which uh, in Berkeley, and he's, uh, he's developing optimal trajectories of doing what we're planning to do. Oops, sorry, I'm trying to get out of this slide. 
All right, so in summary, um, so NASA funds and furthers uh, a lot of ventures in four major areas, exploration to go where no woman or man has gone before, science to understand our planet, um, the rest of the solar system and the universe better, technology developments that uh, eventually spin out into private industries and end up impacting things that are way uh, different from space. And of course, education through internships and other ways to get students involved in our programs. And, and of course, robotics has a role in each of them, but if you're interested in beyond robotics as well, there's plenty out there. So with that, I will end my presentation. And if you have questions, I'll take them now or feel free to email me. Thank you, Dr. Srija. That was super insightful. Um, I do have a few questions. I guess we have just a couple more minutes, but I just want to ask a couple of questions. Um, so, so with with resource mining in other planets, with robots going into you know Mars or Moon, uh, do you think it'll destabilize the delicate balance of our solar system, like the way deforestation has done for global warming? Um, and do we need to worry? And also the other part of that is we already seen so many debris uh, floating around, as you mentioned. Uh, has anyone tried to solve the issue of cleaning up the debris? You know, we've been talking about how to navigate the debris, but not really solving it. Yeah, those are two great questions. So I'll take the first one. Um, I think we as a species have uh, inherent responsibility to protect our planet and the space around us. And over the last uh, 30 years or so, there have been many um, treaties that have been signed between countries like the Outer Space Treaty and so on, uh, which have the countries that are flying things in space to agree on the basic principles of cleaning up after themselves and not doing anything that might harm space irrevocably. And most countries try to keep, uh, keep up with those uh, collaborations and, and things that they've signed the treaty on. And so if they were to explore space in a peaceful and a more collaborative and a non-harmful way, I think we can learn more than we can harm. Uh, there's things in place, it's just up to us to follow those rules. And the second question uh, about cleaning up, I have seen several very, very creative concepts of using large nets, of using torpedoes, uh, and a lot of R&D concepts in order to clean up these debris. But I also want to point out that these are all post facto cleanup. If we can make sure that we responsibly launch and keep track of our space assets so that we don't cause this, uh, it's uh, prevention is much better than the cure. And the cure not only is expensive, it may, not, it, it may be impossible as these uh, debris scale up. Great, thank you. One last question. Uh, we've been talking about Mars uh, quite often lately. I mean, it's on Netflix, people talk about it. What do you think is after Mars? Like we, we never talk what's next after Mars. Once we colonize Mars, what is, what is next? Um, interestingly, after Mars, I think the focus of scientists at NASA have been some of these asteroids, uh, not so much to inhabit them, but to go check out what's out there and, and understand the composition of asteroids so that we can um, either use their resources or maybe even bring some of it back to Earth. Um, I think the other part of exploring asteroids is to understand how they behave so that if something were to come closer to Earth, could we protect our home planet better? Uh, so in terms of exploration, I think it's going to be Moon, Mars, and then asteroids, and then who knows what's after that. Great. Thank you. Well, I, I want to ask one other question, which is just personal question. Do you think there is life outside of uh, Earth? That's a great question. And uh, I would say, why not? We have, uh, we have missions out there like the Kepler and TESS that have discovered Earth-sized planets outside the solar system, uh, which means that the, the gravity and the hydrodynamic stability of those planets is similar to Earth. We've also seen the atmospheric composition of those planets, which are capable of supporting life um, in terms of the spectral signatures we see. Uh, so at this point, it's just getting more and more data from such planets so that we increase our confidence in these planets to support something similar to very early life on Earth before we can send missions towards them to, to understand them better. So I, I don't see why not, unless we have evidence to prove otherwise. Yeah, true. 
All right, I think we're out of time. Uh, and thank you so much, Dr. Shijanag. It was a pleasure having you. And I'll turn it back to uh, Anu. All right, Thanks. thank you. Thank you, Santosh. And thank you, uh, Dr. Nag, for those splendid nuggets. You know, when people come and tell me that, you know, hey, Anu, don't try this. This is not, you know, I mean, try this. It's not rocket science. Now I know what truly rocket science is. <laughs> and and uh, fantastic work. Very proud of your accomplishments. And we wish you the very, very best. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. All right. So the moment you've all been waiting for, all you engineers are doing a fabulous job by being the building blocks of an innovative and enriching future filled with beautiful technologies, creating, building, modeling, designing, executing ideas that actually benefit mankind. I would like to welcome Dr. Thomas Abraham, ASEI National Board Member and Chairman of the ASEI Awards Committee to host the awards segment, celebrating the outstanding achievements in the engineering and technology of those who have contributed to the society at large and to the ASEI organization. Dr. Abraham, the screen is all Thank yours. You. Thank you, Anu. Good afternoon, everyone. I also have another hat via that is I'm the Chairman of the Global Organization of people of Indian origin, Gopio. Hope you all had a good time, especially the conference sessions and uh, you have benefited from it. And I wanted to compliment and congratulate all the team members who did a fantastic job putting together a great uh, conference. So friends, we are in the finale session of this 33rd annual ASEI convention. Uh, that is award ceremony to recognize those who are outstanding achievers among our engineers, uh, engineering community, and those who serve and contributed to ASCI. Uh, we we have a uh, we have a guest of honor. Uh, the chief guest for today this session is uh, Council General Amit Kumar, uh, Honorable Amit Kumar from the Indian Consulate in Chicago. So we just before we do the award ceremony, I just want to say a few words about the award selection process. About uh, ASEI set up an awards committee uh, consisting of um, uh, Jalant, uh, myself, and uh, Piyush. Uh, Jalant, would you please uh, share the screen with me right now? So that yes. you can. Ceremony. Second, second, Thomas. So, a few words about uh, uh, our uh, Council General Amit Kumar. Uh, uh, he has joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1995 um, and and uh, was with the Ministry of External Affairs and served several missions abroad, including Beijing, uh, Tokyo, and also the permanent mission in New York. And before joining as a council general, he was a deputy uh, chief of the mission in Washington, D.C. Um, so uh, I, at this point, I request uh, Amitji, would you please unmute and uh, have your video started? Uh, so I request uh, our chief guest, Amitji, to say a few words. Amitji? Yep, uh, thank you, Dr. Abraham, for those words of introduction. Uh, Mr. Jolant Lakia, President of ASEI. I'm delighted to be present here at this final session of the annual convention of the American Society of Engineers of Indian Origin uh, and address this distinguished gathering. It is exciting for me for many reasons. Uh, first and foremost, it is a privilege to be in company of people who are dreamers and doers. Not only you all are engaged in cutting edge technologies and innovations across different engineering disciplines, you have brought about change that has made an actual difference in our lives for the better. Secondly, you have all stayed connected to your roots, your home country, India, while branching out high and far. You all are an important bridge between our two great countries. Lastly, on a personal note, as a third generation engineer, advances in engineering, science and technology remain close to heart. The prospects for leveraging them for public good and development challenges are enormous. Friends, let me briefly outline our priorities for the India-US relations in the days ahead. I will put them in five main categories. One is, of course, strategic. Two is COVID-related and more broadly, pharma, healthcare, vaccine development, etc. 
third is the ict digital startup space which will both disrupt and transform our lives fourth is climate change environment renewable energy especially solar and last but not the least education research and innovation the government of india has undertaken a number of steps with the objective to strengthen our manufacturing sector and to integrate it more actively with the global supply chains the government has also unveiled a new education policy after 34 years it aims at increasing the allocation for education and research to 6% of gdp from the current 1.7% among other things the new education policy aims at promotion of use of technology at all levels of education it aims at setting up a national research foundation to foster a strong research and innovation culture in the country and there is a strong focus on building a supportive startup ecosystem friends the 4 million strong indian american community and the 200000 indian students in the us mostly in stem areas have been a source of strength for our relations we see the united states as a very close friend and and a strong partner critical to realizing our goal of transforming the economy and meeting our development aspirations of course governments cannot do this alone people like you along with industry and business have to take forward the agenda i look forward to a sustained engagement and to receiving your suggestions on this front stay safe and healthy thank you thank you amit ji for that uh, new initiative and policies of government of india and also thank you for your uh, recognition of indian americans what they can contribute for india so we start with the award ceremony the first award is uh, asei lifetime achievement award to navin jain ceo uh, vyom and chairman moon express you already heard navin talking this uh, the earlier Uh, just to introduce you navin is an entrepreneur driven to solve global grand challenges through in we can't hear you dr thomas i think he's muted mm -hmm. there was Someone... background noise from your end so that's why right. sorry about that so Um, he can, I will. I will. Uh, uh, Moon Express is the only company in the world to have the permission to leave Earth to land on the Moon to harvest planetary resources. Wyoming is focused on dis disrupting healthcare with the goal of making illness effective by identifying microbial biomarkers that are predictive for chronic diseases and. and to adjust microbial imbalance through personalized nutrition navin jain has been awarded many honors for his entrepreneurial successes asa is pleased to bestow this highest award lifetime achievement award to navin jain jalan can you go to the next slide Uh, CG uh, uh, Council General Amit Ji, can you read it so that it becomes the official presentation? Can you unmute Navin Ji, uh, Amit Ji? Yeah. Go ahead, please read it. The American Society of Engineers of Indian Origin, at its 33rd annual national convention on December 5 and 6, 2020. presents the ASEI lifetime achievement award to Mr Navin Jain CEO of Vyom and chairman Moon Express congratulations Mr Jain thank, thank you, you very much uh, we will press, we will send this award to you by mail but may uh, i am sure you would like to say a couple of minutes navin go ahead yeah first of all dr abraham i want to thank you for being uh, continuing to be so kind and continue to lead the uh, indian uh, indians in america and i think your work at gopu and your work at asei really really to me is uh, is something that we should all be very proud of i am humble and honored to be accepting this award and the only thing i can probably tell you is that 
you know, getting a lifetime achievement award looks like something you when you retire sometime when you get old and when you say really you have done everything you want to do. And I really think I'm just at the beginning of my life of the next next thing that I'm going to be doing. And I'm really hopeful that by the time I call it a day, I really hope that we can solve some of these audacious problems. I really think as an entrepreneur that I think everyone who's listening to it really is that, you know, the only way you know you're alive is that you have a, you have a heartbeat and heartbeat goes up and down and up and down. And you don't ever want to live a life which is a smooth life. And you know when your heartbeat goes smooth, you're dead. So you never want to live a dead life. Live a life of adventure that goes up and down and just know when you're at the bottom of that heartbeat, all you have to do is hunker down and know that the next beat is going to be up. And always remember when you're on top of that bead, never to get too cocky because the winter is coming and winter shall come, right? So just all I can tell you is I'm humble and honored. Dr. Abraham, it's an amazing honor and I cherish it. And I really hope every entrepreneur out there know that it's up to us to be able to solve problem, not just identify problem. And we're living in one of the most innovative decade in the human history. And there's not a problem that the technology cannot solve. So as engineers, it's up to us, not just to dream, not just to imagine, but to go out and get things done. And I really hope the next decade will bring many of these grand challenges uh, to be a, as a history and the things something we look back in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Naveen. This is not a retirement award. We are looking forward more initiative and no, uh, more, more uh, programs and plans uh, which we look forward in the future. At this point, Thank I you. request uh, our next, uh, uh, to present the next body. I request Piyush Malik to join. Piyush. Hello everyone. Um, our, uh, Jwalan, can you move this slide to the next one? All right. Uh, can we have Jyoti Bansal on the camera, please, uh, after me? Uh, our ASCI Engineering Entrepreneur of the Year Award goes to serial tech entrepreneur, Jyoti Bansal. He's the founder of AppDynamics Harness Traceable Unusual Ventures, and he is a Silicon Valley technology visionary. He believes passionately in changing the world for better and uh, through software. And in 2008, he founded AppDynamics, uh, an application intelligence company that provides enterprises with real-time insights into application performance. And uh, he led the company as the founder and CEO for the first eight years, and then uh, until uh, it was acquired by Cisco for 3.7 billion in 2017. After that, he launched Big Labs, a startup studio, where he can help create companies that define the future of software and technology. He's currently the CEO and co-founder of Harness, a fast-growing startup aiming to revolutionize software delivery process and CEO and co-founder of Traceable, a software cybersecurity company. And, um, and now he has uh, founded Unusual Ventures, uh, a 400 million venture capital fund focused on helping early stage technology entrepreneurs. Jyoti, it's our honor can, to give can you this. Uh, can you, okay, Piyush, go ahead and read the... All right. That's okay. American Society of Engineers of Indian Origin at its 33rd National Convention on December 6th uh, presents ASCI Engineering Entrepreneur of the Year Award to Jyoti Bansal, serial tech entrepreneur, founder of AppDynamics, Harness, Traceable, and Unusual Ventures. Jyoti, you can uh, start your speech, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Piyush. Uh, this is really an honor, and I would really like to thank uh, ASCI for this award. It was so inspiring to, to hear from Naveen, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, and uh, Naveen, uh, congratulations for your uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. I really love the passion and energy that, you know, you're continuing to solve problems, uh, uh, you know, as, as long as you, uh, you know, want to solve them. And I would say that's really what we engineers are all about. We love to solve problems. And, you know, I, to me, you know, I really, really believe, you know, as a software engineer, that software has such a strong ability to redefine the world in so many ways. And you know, as, as, as engineers, we can go and create solutions to bigger and bigger problems. And if you look at hard times like these, like 2020 with the pandemic and what's happening in the world and society, 
it's even more important for us as engineers to, to find interesting problems that, that we are passionate about, that we think uh, can move the world, move the society forward and, and solve them. So you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really honored and really uh, you know, thankful for, for, for this award today. I would say, you know, uh, entrepreneurship is not an easy journey, but it's all all worth it. You get to, uh, you know, uh, you go through hard times, you go through ups and downs, but it's uh, in the end, if you can if you can solve some big problems and make a difference, that 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 really counts. So I, I wish uh, each one of you all the best in your journeys as engineers. You know, the impact you can make. You know, it's it's uh, made the the science and technology and engineering is is what is going to drive the future of the world forward. And I'm I'm very very thankful and uh, and honored to uh, to receive this award today. Thank you, thank you, Jyoti, and wish you all the best for your future endeavors. At this point, I invite uh, AICI President Jalan Lakia to present the next award. Jalan. Thank you, Thomas. It is my privilege uh, to present the next award. It's uh, ACI Engineer of the Year Award in the fields of mechanical and solar energy to Professor du D. Yogi Goswami. Dr. Goswami is the distinguished university professor and director of the Clean Energy Research Center at the University of South Florida. Professor Goswami is the editor-in-chief of the Solar Energy Journal and Progress in Solar Energy. He is author or editor of 16 books and more than 300 technical papers. He is a recipient of many distinguished awards for his outstanding work. Dr. Goswami is also a recipient of the highest energy related awards of ASME, ASES, ISES, and AAES, and more than 50 other awards and certificates from major engineering and scientific societies. Uh, is Dr. Goswami uh, video on? I can't see his video because I'm presenting, so I just want to make sure. Jadon, can you put the next slide and read the Yogi is, Yogi is there. Go okay, ahead. very nice. So uh, American Society of Engineers of Indian Origin at uh, its 33rd annual national convention on December 5th and 6th presents ACI Engineer of the Award of the year award to Dr. D. Yogi Goswami, Distinguished University Professor, Director, Clean Energy Research Center at the University of South Florida, and Editor-in-Chief, Solar Energy. Dr. Goswami, if you can please uh, share your thoughts on this award. Thank you so much, uh, Jolan and, and Thomas. Thank you for contacting me after 30 years <laughs> of first meeting you. Uh, at the Gopio meeting. Uh, I'm indeed humbled by this award, knowing that the members of the society are literally changing the world with their innovations. Uh, I understand that you're honoring me for my innovations in solar energy, an area I started to focus on back in the 1970s, because I was convinced at that time that our future energy source is solar energy not because of the environment, but simple arithmetic uh, of available energy resources versus our future energy needs. However, I'm gonna take a minute to focus on another uh, innovation, uh, which is disrupting a huge well-established industry. Okay. And that grew out of a personal need. That is my son is asthmatic from birth. And my wife and I, we took care of his food allergies like peanuts and other nuts and other proteins. Uh, but we figured that there were some other triggers of asthma and they were in the air. So I searched and searched for commercially available air purifiers and found that there was nothing available other than filters. The best being HEPA filter which was developed in the 1940s. All those people here in technology area think of what was available in 1940s. These filters can only filter out particles from air, but what was affecting my son and what causes us all health problems is not the dust particles, 
but the volatile organic chemicals, VOCs emitted from most of what we have in indoors, bacteria, viruses, mold, other spores, endotoxins, mycotoxins, and other proteins from allergens. So I needed a whole new technology to take care of these things, which by the way, came out of a solar technology I had developed back in 1990, photoelectrochemical oxidation or PICO. So this technology helped my son Dilip and my daughter Jaya, and they have brought it to the world as molecule molecule with a K. So molecule has become enormously successful because it is the first new innovation in this space since 1940s and is helping millions of other children. This technology doesn't just filter uh, pollutants but actually destroys them. And it's very timely because of COVID-19. So FDA gave it clearance uh, for reducing the risk against COVID-19. As you know, COVID-19 is transmitted mostly as airborne virus. And molecule was shown to destroy more than 99.99% of a surrogate of COVID-19. So finally, hospitals have started using it. Mercy Health chain of hospitals in Illinois and Wisconsin being the first. Uh, for me, though, the greatest satisfaction and pleasure comes from the thousands of messages I have received and I continue to receive from mothers who tell me, thank you, your invention has really helped my children, is helping my children. So that is my satisfaction uh, because I invented it for my son and it's helping all of the other children. So finally, Thank you again, ASEI. I'm indeed humbled by this award. Thank you, Yogi. Um, a ladies and gentlemen, um, ASEI is proud to present the next Engineer of the Year Award in Product Engineering and Operations Management. Devil Desai, Vice President and India Country Head, Magna International. Uh, Magna International is a global automotive supplier that designs, develops, and manufactures components and systems for the world's leading automakers. In this position, Desai is responsible for digital marketing, strategic, strategic business development, and continued expansion in India, and serve as one of the senior representatives of, for Magna in India. Yesterday we heard they will. Now, may I have the next slide? Um, uh, ASCA 33rd Annual Convention, uh, December 5 to 6, 2020. ASI Engineer, ASCA Engineer of the Year Award presented to Deval Desai, Vice President and India Country Head Magna International. Deval? Thank you very much, Dr. Abraham. I'm truly honored to receive this award and really for being part of uh, ASEI for the past several years. And I'm, I'm really excited that you know, ASEI is taking this initiative and really having been an engineer as part of my education as well as major part of my career before I moved to business and operations. I can really say that you know, an engineering uh, 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 portion of your career is a very pragmatic one. You know, as they say, you know, to, to an optimist, the glass is half full. Uh, to a pessimist, the glass is half empty. And to an engineer, the glass is twice as big as it needs to be. And I can still tell you, even after 25 years after having designed the last headlamp for a car, I still look at a new car and try to figure out what kind of technology it does have. So I think it's, it's, it's a fantastic event. Uh, thank you to the entire ACI team uh, uh, for really uh, having a successful session this year. And to uh, Naveen and Jyoti for uh, their contributions as well and to the uh, uh, award recipients. And to Mr. Kumar for really taking the time of a busy schedule to uh, join us today. I think India has made a, played a major role in science and tech uh, of today. And, and I think these are gonna continue as COVID has really changed the scale and the speed at which innovation is gonna happen. So 
Um, thank you, everybody, and I appreciate and uh, I'm honored for receiving the award. Thank you. Thank you, Deva. Uh, the last several years, about six years, we have had an award called a ASCI Founders Award. Unfortunately, Harry Bindal, who is the who established this award, passed away about three weeks back. So I have a special person uh, to present and talk about Harry Bindal's contribution to ASCI. I introduce Dr. Neeraj Bindal, optometric with the private practice in Arlington, Virginia, and Washington, D.C., son of ASCI founder, the late Dr. Harry Bindal, to present the next awardee. Neeraj? Thank, thank you so much. For, for a few minutes. Neeraj, go ahead. I hope you can hear me uh, okay. So um, thank you so much for giving me the time and uh, to be able to present a little tribute to my uh, dad. So thank you, ASEI board, the members and uh, friends. Um, just a few words I'd like to say about him. Uh, uh, my dad, Harry Bindle was a young 76. He would have turned uh, 77 actually yesterday. And I say young purposefully because he was full of life and still had his hands full and then some. His story, as he puts it, is truly inspirational and a rags to riches story. He was born in a small village in Agra with limited water, electricity, and no local schools. His passion for education was paramount. As I remember my father telling me that he had to walk miles to go to school and use the street lights to study under. He was always the first in academics. By the time he was 27, he was married, had my sister and I, and moved to the, <clears throat> moved to the land of opportunity uh, with just a few dollars in his pockets. He moved during the recession in the 70s during the oil embargo. Uh, jobs were very little to none. A good friend of his invited him to West Virginia and helped him secure his very first job. I think he paid all of $13,000. After finding a job, my sister and I came to the US and I remember him working very hard and taking evening classes and, uh, and, you know, and still making time for us. And I'll never remember my sister and I asking for things, um, but he was very interested. He got us a bike, he had a Christmas tree. You know, we went out and took professional photo uh, portraits, family portraits that we have in our living room now. And, uh, you know, and I don't think that we lacked anything. Maybe just, you know, we didn't ask for anything and we didn't lack anything. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, and, um, he took us, you know, skiing and camping and road trips. Um, he had an interest in everything. Um, and had he not, you know, we probably would have missed out on many great experience and memories. As new and better job opportunities became available, you know, it was time to pack and move. He definitely wasn't afraid of change moved to Kentucky and Michigan and Florida, and then finally the city that he had always wanted to be living in in quite some time, DC. He's worked for private companies and cities and states and federal governments, the US Air Force, uh, Coast Guard. In 1983, he founded, as you know, the ASEI, the American Society of Engineers from India, um, his pride and joy. Now, almost 40 years later now, there are hundreds of members and chapters across the country sharing ideas and technology and providing scholarships and awards to individuals of excellence. Um, in 1990, I remember my dad helped me make my first feature film, Akanksha. He was an executive producer and just, you know, just another thing that I learned in his book that he was very, very proud of. <clears throat> he is a poet, a writer, and his work can be found in his self-published books alongside his autobiography that incorporates his goods and bads and many of his typos. I learned more about him through his book than I would have otherwise. He worked on the Ganges Sanitation Project and founding ASEI earned him the, uh, the Pravasi Bharat, uh, not the, uh, uh, the Sanam Award in 2017 from the president of India. And then in 2018, he also received the Pravasi UP Ratna Award from the governor of UP. He's a proud Hindu, a supporter of the Hindu American Foundation, the Vishwa Hindu Prashad of America, just members of numerous communities and participants at the Indian Embassy events. You know, as uh, you know, I was counting and uh, some of the stuff that he wrote in his book as of 2015, 
you know, he has a bachelor's, two masters, 47 awards, 105 certificates, five technical papers, seven professional memberships, five publications, three film scripts. He served on 12 community service organizations and five public service community communities. And he had the opportunity to travel over 40 countries on five continents. He was truly selfless. He spoke honestly and practical, especially when it came to money. Um, that reminds me of a story that my dad and I had, uh, you know, not too long ago, just a few months ago. Um, and, you know, he'd rather save a dollar on himself uh, so he can do better for others. Um, he was talking about making a trip to India, and I told him to make sure he buys at least a business class uh, because of his health reasons that so he can keep his feet up. And he said, why should I do that? I can buy a coach class for 1000 and a business class is 4000 You know, for the $3,000 that he can save, he can donate that money instead. And that's exactly what he does. For the last 20 years, he has been giving back to his birthplace in India. He donate, he's donated books, backpacks, supplies, and then scholarships to uh, school children for the last 20 years. In 2018, in his uh, hometown, he rebuilt the temple and he expanded uh, their school. And just this past September, he started his own company called Enviro A to Z LLC. As my grandfather's goal was for my dad to be a hardworking person, I think so was his. He wanted to see his children get a good education, stand on their own two feet and have grandchildren. Well, my sister accomplished that goal with grandchildren for him many, many years ago. I was lucky enough to accomplish that goal just a little over a month ago by giving him a granddaughter. He hung around just long enough in the hospital to be able to see a photograph of me holding her. My daughter now has the honor of having his name, Savannah Ava Curry Bindle. When I think about my dad, I think about his accomplishments professionally, personally, and every of them were achieved really by his own doing. He had a desire to live to the fullest, whether it was shared with others or on his own terms. Nothing has ever stopped him, and I hope that I have in me even half the ambition and conscience that he has. Um, in his autobiography book, My Journey, he writes that his biggest accomplishment is that he had a successful done a daughter. <clears throat> you know, and to me, I would just kind of, how can we not be when we were surrounded by his support, the values and guidance and love that he gave us? So I thank you for making it so easy by writing about your life, your journey, and all in one place for me so I can keep you close to my heart, remember you, uh, understand you, and pass you down for generations to come. Your legacy as the founder of ASCI will continue and the Bindle family will make sure you're not forgotten. The Founders Award now, re re now renamed to Hurry B. Bindle ASCI Founders Award will continue as long as the organization lasts. That's our promise to you. Uh, without further ado, I have the privilege to allow uh, me to introduce this year's Harry B. Bindel, ASCI Founders Award, Ms. Patsala Abadia. Uh, she also happens to have been the Michigan president uh, for the ASCI for the last two years, and she was also the chairperson for this year's GET 2020 convention. She is the IT Systems Architect at Seco Tools. She has almost 30 years of experience in collaboration solutions and CRM applications across multiple platforms. She has a master's in computer applications from BIT, Mesero with executive MBA degree. She has a professional certification in project management, ITL, Scrum, and Six Sigma. Batula is uh, extremely passionate about life and values at each moment as a beautiful gift. She has been a national level volleyball player back in India and is a techno geek who believes that there is a solution for every problem. We need to just dig deep enough. A big congratulations to Batsala Pavia. Yeah. Ne Neeraj, could you please read the screen, the, the plaque? Oh, yes, absolutely. So we have the, uh, the it's, it's labeled, so the plaque that we have, American Society of Engineers of Indian Origin, ASEI, the 33rd Annual National Convention, December 5, 6, 2020. H. Bindle, ASEI Founders Award presented to uh, Vatsala Apadia, President, ASEI Michigan Chapter. So, and it has, of course, Dr. Abrahams and uh, uh, Jalwal Lakia's name on it. 
So again, congratulations to you. And I hope I get a chance to talk to you later on and talk to you personally. So I'm so honored and uh, to be able to present this on behalf of my dad. I know he normally does this. And so again, thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for working so hard and making the organization uh, that it is. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Neeraj. And thank you to the entire Bindal family. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Kum uh, Mr. Kumar, uh, Jualent, and Piyush. It is indeed a very emotional moment for all of us here. This award is Hariji's faith and confidence that he has bestowed upon, upon me. It is his legacy of enthusiasm that he has passed on to me. And I can promise you, Hariji, that I will do my very best to live up to it. I am what I am because of the wonderful people uh, who have touched my life, my friends, family, colleagues, and everyone else. So thank you all. A shout out to ASEI. What is amazing about ASEI is the fact that it is large enough for people like Dr. Thomas Ibrahim and Hariji uh, in it that you can make a difference across the globe. And it is small enough that your individual voice does not get drowned. A word of thanks to my Michigan chapter team. A leader is only as good as his or her team. So thanks for always being there to provide support, to have provided support to me. So lastly, I just want to tell you, Hariji, a virtual conference did not imply that you were not supposed to be here physically present with us here. But I'm sure you're watching over us from there. We miss you, but we know that you are always going to be there for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Neeraj, once again. Thank you. Yes, and we'll touch base. I would love to speak to you as well. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Vatsala. Thank you, Neeraj. Back to you, um, Dr. Thomas Abraham. Is uh, Dr. Abraham still on? Is he unmuted? Yeah, he's not mute. He's unmuted. Okay, Me, thank you. I was telling uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Neeraj Bindal for the great tribute you gave for Hariji. Uh, to present the next award, I request uh, uh, Piyush uh, Malik again. Piyush? Piyush, can you come? Piyush? Okay, I think. I'm here. Um, yeah. Can you guys hear me? All right, yes. the ASCI Service Excellence Award is being presented to none other than Rakesh Patel, who is the current treasurer. He's been the president in the past of ASCI National, and um, uh, he is uh, an engineer, entrepreneur, board advisor, and IT consultant for various domains of emerging technologies. Working as a global IT compliance at uh, General Motors, in Detroit, Michigan, for the past eight years. Uh, previously, he, was, he has provided IT consulting services to IBM, Chrysler, EDS, HP, Ford, and various other industries. Also, Rakesh has been serving executive and board member positions at various professional and nonprofit organizations. Rakesh received an engineering degree from India and master's in management of technology from the University of Phoenix, US. Um, as I said earlier, Rakesh has served ACI since 2012 in various roles, uh, and uh, including national and Michigan chapter as well, and as the current convention co-chair. So with that, if you could move on. Yeah, I'll read the flag. Uh, American Society of Engineers of Indian Origin, ACI, 33rd Annual National Convention, December 5th and 6th, 2020, ASCI Service Excellence Award presented to Rakesh Patel in recognition of your dedicated service and commitment to ASCI. Rakesh, please uh, say a few words. Uh, thank you, Piyush. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Thomasji. I'm really honored for, uh, uh, for receiving this award. Actually, this award already should go to my family who let me work on my passion. Uh, and most important, all ACI team members who have been working with me since the last uh, three, 10 years and helping ACI organization. 
make sure it is a word, is for AACIK. As Mr. Sam Pitora addressed yesterday to young engineers, and I'm a strong believer that any act when multiplied by thousands of people can transform the world. What we do at ACI for our engineering community, hope can transform to the world. So be part of the community and be part of the ACI. Also I would like to congratulate uh, congratulations to other awardees who have received the AAC awards today. Thank you once again, uh, Piyush, Dr. Thomas, Mr. Kumar, Jolan, and both an entire AAC team. Thank you guys. Thank you, Rakesh. Uh, we have two more awards. Uh, I invite Jolan uh, to present the next awardee. It is my uh, privilege once again to uh, talk about this next award. It's our service leadership and contribution to ACI recognition uh, for Rakesh uh, Guliani. Uh, Rakesh is vice president at Park Computer Systems and has served as director at ACI Silicon Valley chapter, focusing on STEM and internship activities. With education and background in software engineering and entrepreneurial experience of building a job board and application tracking system. He drives innovative solutions, coaches leaders to be successful and develops strong diverse teams, uh, attracting, <coughs> retaining, mentoring and developing talent are his, some of his key strengths. So once again, um, I would like to read the plaque that you would be sending to Rakesh. American Society of Engineers uh, of Indian Origin, ACI, at 33rd Annual National Convention on December 5th and 6th, 2020, presents Leadership and Contribution to ACI Award to Rakesh Bulyan. Rakesh, would you please say a few words? Absolutely. Thank you, Jalan. Thank you, ACI, Dr. Brian, and Piyush, and Mr. Amit Kumar. Uh, first off, my... Uh, Heartiest congratulations uh, to Naveen Jain, uh, Jyoti Bansal, Dr. Goswami, Devul Desai, uh, Vatsala Upadhyay, uh, Rakesh Patel, and other uh, award recipients. I'm really honored to get this recognition and truly humbled to accept it. A big thank you to our Silicon Valley team, Piyush Malik, Lakshmi Patel, Sunita Dablish, Santosh Shankola, and Amrish Chopra for always going the extra mile and successfully executing so many projects and events. Uh, and I also wanna wish uh, all the very best to everyone here uh, who participated uh, in ACI event today. Uh, thank you for the award. Thank you, Rakesh. Thank you, thank you Rakesh. Uh, our final award uh, will be presented by uh, Piyush. Piyush Malik, please come back. All right. Our Congratulations to Rakesh. And uh, our next uh, awardee for leadership and contribution to ACI is Sunita Dublish. Uh, Sunita is a web developer with front end as well as back end skills and more than 15 years of experience in web development. She believes in creating great experiences for end users. And uh, she has worked at startups, nonprofits, and for profit companies. She has a computer science degree from IET Lucknow and uh, she also serves and has served on boards at several nonprofit organizations. Um, Sunita has served at Silicon Valley ASCI chapter as a volunteer for a few years. And uh, since 2020, she's uh, on the board as a director. So congratulations, Sunita. And I'll read the next uh, plaque, uh, if you could move on. American Society of Engineers of Indian Origin, ASCI, 33rd Annual National Convention, December 5th and 6th, 2020. Leadership and com Contribution to ASCI Award presented to Sunita Dublish. Sunita, you may uh, say a few words. Thank you, ASI, for giving me this award. Um, I have to thank Piyush for <laughs> this award because when I moved to California, I was looking to uh, help a non-profit, you know, and he somehow found me. We had worked together 25 years ago and uh, I remember the call, he called me late in the night and he was like, oh, Sarita, you're here. 
So, but uh, he needed some help with the website and that's my passion, you know, creating great user experience. So I'm <clears throat> so humbled and honored to receive this uh, award. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all awardees and uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, a special thanks to Council General Amit Kumarji for joining us uh, this, uh, this afternoon, although I contacted him only about three days back, but he was kind enough to accept our invitation. In the process of uh, all this organization, we didn't have the chance to write him early that I apologize, we should have written him early, but he was kind enough to come and give a good message about what we could do for India. Um, I uh, also congratulate all the awardees and now hand over to Anu. Anu? Thank you so much, Dr. Abraham and uh, and uh, Sri Amitji. Thank you so much for honoring us today with your time and your presence. And congratulations to all the winners, well deserved. And I'm positive that you would continue to give back and serve the engineering community with all your experiences, wisdom, keeping up Mr. Hari Bindal's legacy. Thank you for all that you do. Well, all good things have to come to an end. I, I really don't want to say the word end, but the two days have been nothing short of remarkable and informative. The speakers have enriched our lives with their experiences and fascinating stories, isn't it? And what happened last evening was nothing short of an exemplary display of skills and brilliance by the YTE kids. It just left the audience spellbound. I would like to invite the versatile Michigander, Bhavesh Joshi, ASEI convention co-chair for his closing remarks. Thank you, thank you, Anu. Um, thank you very much. As uh, convention co-chairs, uh, Rakesh Patel and I would like to thank uh, everybody for their participation and support. Uh, let me share my screen, just a second. Can you hear me okay? Can everybody see the screen? Yes. Okay, awesome. Yes, thank you. So first and foremost, I would really like to thank the ASEI National Convention Planning Team for tirelessly planning and executing this uh, successful two-day virtual convention. Uh, as you can see, the credit goes to our leader, Jwalant Lakhia, president of ASEI, uh, Piyush Malik, convention content chair, um, ASEI Silicon Valley president, Vatsala Upadhyay, Convention Technology Chair, and also ASCI Michigan President, and uh, <coughs> Dr. Thomas Abram, ASCI Awards Chair Director. Thank you very much. Without uh, this diligent planning from the team members, this virtual convention would not have been possible. I'd also like to thank uh, all the ASCI and national board members and all the local chapter presidents and their boards and all our membership. Uh, special remembrance to Dr. Hari Bindal. We really have lost a legend. We really had a wonderful uh, time yesterday, you know, with all the keynote speakers and the technical speakers. With, and we ended up with the YTE finalists. Uh, we're going to announce the results uh, at the end. Um, so we'd like to thank all the keynote speakers, all the technical speakers, and all the help from the panelists and session owners, uh, Amrish Chopra, Rakesh uh, Guliani, Sunita Dublish, Santosh Ankola, Mamta Nairn, Sukrutha Badudia, uh, Rakesh Patel, and myself. This convention, we really have, would like to thank our sponsor, Mr. Chinmay Deshpande from C4D Mortgage. Thank you very much for your sponsorship. We also just would like to thank the award committee led by Dr. Thomas Abraham, Joland Lakia, and Piyush Malik. And congratulations to all the award finalists. Thank you very much. This convention needs a lot of logistics, a lot of website updates, and this would not have been possible with our website and convention logistics team. Uh, Rakesh Patel, Sanjay Patel, Lalita Kambampati, they really worked very hard to make sure 
All our communication, our website updates were current and going to all the registrants. All the help from the convention logistic teams, uh, Ravi and Anjali, thank you very much. And a big thank you to Anur <coughs> Krishnan, the convention master of ceremony. Wonderful, uh, keeping us all glued each and every session and very in insightful comments and commentary. Last but not the least, our Youth Technology Committee here, led by uh, Piyush Malik, Muthu, and Amrish. And we saw the wonderful presentations <laughs> from our young budding entrepreneurs, scientists, showcasing their projects. We had six participants. And now uh, we're gonna announce uh, the winners. The winners from YTE. The first place winner is uh, Nidhi. Mathiali, congratulations. Jyoti Rani is the number two. Isha Jagdish, number three. But all of you are winners. Uh, Divya, Ojas, and Manan, uh, you're all the finalists. Congratulations. You are our budding uh, scientists, leaders, and CEOs of the future. We should all encourage. Mm -hmm. Last but not the least, uh, we really want to thank each and every one of you for participating in this uh, two-day virtual conference. If you have the passion, time, and energy, please, uh, we welcome everybody to join ASCI. Please visit our website, asciusa.org, for further details. Thank you. Good night. And our conference will be wrapped today. All right, thank you so much, Bhavesh, from the invention of the wheel in ancient history to the modern day drones, engineering constructs have provided the vital push for the progress of human technology. Engineers, all of you out there, we thank you. We thank you for making our dreams possible, for creating the world around us and for paving the way for tomorrow's dreamers. To all you attendees and viewers, while you're enjoying your friends and family this season, don't forget to thank an engineer for making your gathering possible. I definitely love all the board members of ASCI to please come on screen, make yourself visible so that Sri Amit G knows that we have such beautiful, beautiful, talented folks around uh, for ASCI. Thank you for attending the 33rd ASCI National Convention, GET 2020. On behalf of ASCI, continue to enjoy the discoveries around you. Stay loved, spread your love, and have a safe and blessed festive season. Videos and presentations will soon be available on www.aseiusa.org. So all you ASCI board members, a great, great, fantastic achievements. I think you guys did it and it's a wrap. So ciao everybody and have a wonderful rest of the Sunday. Take care and, and have Manu a blessed day. From all of us, I, uh, all of us, it was thank wonderful. You, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. You take care. Bye-bye. See you. Thank you, thank you Amit Ji. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you Amit Ji. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Amit. You. Thank you, Neeraj, wherever you are. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear me, but thank you so much. Yes, thank, thank you, Neeraj. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Abraham. Thank you. Thank Ho you. Hopefully next year we'll be in person, right? A real, uh, in, 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 uh, in person. So we look forward to uh, seeing everyone in person next year then. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Yeah, good goal. Okay. Take care, you all. <laughs>